40 here. So there are three things that everybody thinks that they can do. And everybody thinks they can act. Everybody thinks that they can host a talk show. And uh, everybody thinks that they can just intuit what uh, election law is all about. And there are certain things in life that you can't just understand on your intuition, right? You can't build a nuclear bomb just on the basis of your intuition. You can't understand the Talmud just on the basis of your intuition. You can't uh, learn Chinese just on the basis of your intuition, all right? So we, we may think, oh, I can just figure this out with my common sense. Well, it, it ain't necessarily true. So I'm far from an expert on, on voter fraud. I've just read a few books on the topic because after the 2020 election, I was furious that uh, voter fraud may have decided the 2020 election. So one of the best books I read is by a liberal academic, Lorraine C. Minity, and she published this book in 2010, The Myth of Voter Fraud. And she did a lot of hard work. So it's effortless to make accusations of voter fraud. Absolutely effortless. But to track down the accusations and try to figure out what's true and what's just propaganda or nonsense, that takes real work. And she did the work. So she notes that it's, it goes completely against the individual's incentives to commit voter fraud. Because on the one hand, the rewards of committing voter fraud are that your one vote may sway an election. All right? So the rewards are tiny, tiny, tiny for committing voter fraud for individuals. And then the downside of committing voter fraud is that you can be prosecuted, sent to prison. It's a, a felony. So voter fraud committed by voters is exceedingly rare. But allegations of voter fraud are ubiquitous, right? So if you commit voter fraud, there are very stiff penalties against you. But if you make false allegations of voter fraud, there's no blowback. There's no price to pay for just you know churning out all these accusations. So. Every time there's a close election, you hear the specter of voter fraud. It was voter fraud that decided this election. So in 2016, the Democrats couldn't accept the results. So they essentially said voter fraud. It was Russian interference. And less informed, less intelligent Democrats thought that somehow Russia had hacked out our voting machines, for which there was absolutely no evidence. Now, all states criminalize voter fraud. But... Uh, Different states have different standards, and then there are even county standards, city standards. All right, so voters everywhere in the United States must be registered, their eligib eligibility and identity verified, and registration lists by law are regularly called by county clerks, eliminating people who've died, moved away, or become ineligible to vote. So in New Jersey, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, mail ballots were sent to all active registered voters and the return of envelopes were barcoded so that ballots could be tracked. Voter signatures were checked against the registration rolls. Anyone who mailed a ballot who attempts to vote in person will be given a provisional ballot. It will be verified and counted after all the mail ballots have been processed. So the Conservative Heritage Foundation has uh, Hans von Popovsky as their resident voter fraud expert and they've been compiling data for more than a decade on voter fraud and they are trying to push the idea that voter fraud is real rampant easy to commit and easy to hide they've developed a database going back to 1988 contains just 206 cases of fraudulent use of an absentee ballot so that breaks down to about six cases a year so over the same period about 1.6 billion votes were cast in federal elections alone so if you've got about uh, 206 cases of uh, fraudulent use of an absentee ballot versus 1.6 billion votes cast, then it's, uh, it's not really a huge problem. Now, voter fraud, another problem with voter fraud is that it can mean so many different things. So when I'm talking about voter fraud, I mean voter fraud that is a crime and is prosecuted. Now, you can argue voter fraud is difficult to prove because people try to uh, get away with their crimes. Well, everybody tries to get away with their crimes. So you may say, oh, it's just hard, so hard to detect. That's why we've been unable to detect uh, voter fraud. Well, 
most people, when they commit crimes, they, they don't do it expecting to get caught. People with all crimes, they, they try to get away with, with what they're doing. So in America, about half of the votes in 2020 were by mail-in ballots. And we have five states in the United States that have exclusively used mail-in ballots for years. And we don't have any evidence that there is a dramatically higher rate of uh, voter fraud caused by mail-in ballots. So Lorraine C. Minity, she wrote an excellent book, The Myth of Voter Fraud. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming out this evening. Um, this book actually took, I don't know, anywhere from five to seven years to research. And so it is based on a lot of uh, incredibly hard research. I mean, this isn't the kind of research that takes you to foreign countries and puts you in harm's way. But um, I started out with a simple question about how much voter fraud there actually was, because this argument that, Mike, uh, that Mark was alluding to um, is used constantly. You can look in the history of the expansion of voting rights in the United States. And every turn, every single turn, the challenge is to overcome the claim that to make it just a little bit uh, easier to vote for people is to open up the floodgates for all the criminals in the United States to cast ballots um, more than once. So we wanted to know, just answer a simple question. Was this actually a problem? Um, and it turns out that political scientists haven't studied this much at all. There's really uh, no, there was no good academic research um, out there to answer the question. And I, actually, I, I came at this in a somewhat naive way. I thought, well, this wouldn't be that hard to figure out because I know a lot about election data and social science data and political data and data sets and how they're kept and so forth. And I thought, well, this, would, this, this won't take me very long. Um, but it actually turned, to be, turned out to be quite difficult to try to just document whether or not there was a problem. So, you know, I think I, I, I say here in this book, of course, we all believe that democracy demands electoral integrity um, and that one fraudulent vote is one too many. Um, I don't say in this book this never happens. I say it rarely happens. And, um, you know, this is based on uh, trying to collect statistics from every attorney general in the United States, every secretary of state in the United States. I sent letters to every single county district attorney in the United States. I use open record laws. I use Freedom of Information Act requests for the federal government uh, because this, this whole uh, current um, kind of movement to push photo ID laws um, is really a party trick. And it got some impetus with the Bush Justice Department when the, when the Bush Justice Department uh, launched right after the 2000 election, by the, by the spring of 2001, had put together a program called the Ballot Access and Voting Integrity Initiative at the Justice Department. And actually, that name, the, the Ballot Access and Voting Integrity Initiative, um, was the name of a program that the Reagan Justice Department ran in the 1980s when they went after black civil rights activists in Alabama and other parts of the, of the South. Um, and it was a similar kind of, uh, uh, kind of intimidation campaign. Um, charging people, charging these civil rights activists, some of, some of whom had worked with Martin Luther King and were engaged. Oh my gosh, they work with Martin Luther King. We, we don't want to intimidate them. Anyway, Ann Coulter devoted her December 9, 2020 column to the topic of voter fraud. It's got the headline, Voter Fraud Never Happens Except in 10,000 Cases. So she says, media have been lying about voter fraud for 20 years. The New York Times or the Washington Post will tell you Let's get something straight. There are only two cases of voter fraud in history, and they were both Republicans. Never? No voter fraud ever? Nope. That's your first clue. They're lying. Liberals don't try to say partial birth abortion never happens. They don't say black men killing cops never happens. They don't say immigrants ripping off government programs never happens. Only voter fraud never happens. Well, I, I don't know any. She doesn't provide any sources. So this, this column is just a whole series of wild assertions, some of them have some basis in fact, and others have no basis in fact. Nobody says voter fraud never happens. But according to the Heritage Foundation, which propagates the message that voter fraud is frequent and easy and widespread, they're only able to document about 1,200 cases since 1988 in 1.6 billion votes. That's, that's hardly anything. So Anne does not provide any evidence for her assertions because there isn't any. Now, I, I'm no expert, once again, in, in voter fraud. I've just started reading about it. But uh, you can't just intuit these things. You can't just figure it out using your common sense, guys. You, you need to know about modular voting architecture, better known as frogs. You need to know about vertical proximity effects in California recall elections. You need to know about security vulnerabilities and problems with the VVPT, right? How's your VVPT, baby? 
voter verifiable paper trail? And how much research have you done into rational and pluralistic models of Harvard implementation? So voter fraud is not some brand new topic. We've been talking a lot about it since the passage of the Motor Voter Act in 1993. We had intense interest in voter fraud in the 2000 election. It's been a frequent topic in the news. And uh, so come on, guys, we have to, we have to learn we have to learn the technology, all right? We, ha- we, have to, we have to look at the peer-reviewed studies. Did you guys know that my book, A History of X, was peer-reviewed? So before, the prestigious publisher, Prometheus Press in New York, took on my book, A History of X, 100 Years of Sex in Film. It got peer-reviewed. It got sent to Vern Buller, okay? Vern Buller uh, approved my book. And you're going, whoa, 40, that's that's amazing. I mean, Vern Buller, he was an American historian and a sexologist. He was a distinguished professor emeritus at the State University of New York at Buffalo. And he was faculty president of California State University, Northridge. He was the past president of the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. All right. He was a member of the editorial board of Padika, the Journal of Pedophilia. All right. He read my manuscript for A History of X, 100 Years of Sex and Film, and he recommended that it be published. So I didn't just ejaculate A History of X out onto the world. It went through peer review. Okay, Vern Buller, historian, sexologist, a member of the editorial board of Padika, the Journal of Pedophilia. Right, he went through my book. He recommended it for publication. I mean, this guy, he got his BA from the University of Utah. He got his MA from the University of Chicago. He got his PhD from the University of Chicago. He was the author, co-author of editor of nearly 50 books, contributed chapters to another 75 books. He had over 100 peer-reviewed articles, hundreds of more popular articles. He was an expert in sexology, history, community health, public policy, contraception, population issues. He lectured in most of the 50 states and 20 foreign countries. He received the Alfred Kinsey Award for Distinguished Sex Research. He's the one who read my book, peer-reviewed it, and told told, uh, Prometheus Books that they should uh, take it on. All right, so peer review, mate. Good on peer review. All right. So here are the books that I've been reading on Voter fraud. So here are the start with the three that I respect. The Myth of Voter Fraud by Lorraine C. Minity came out in 2010. Election Meltdown, Dirty Tricks, Distrust, and the Threat to American Democracy by Richard Hosen. He is a law professor at the University of California, Irvine. And then Voting Wars from Florida 2000 to the Next Election Meltdown, again by Richard Hosen. That came out in 2012. Three conservative books that I wanted to like, wanted to respect, but not only could I not respect them in the morning, I could not even respect them as I was reading them. I mean, that's how dirty and tawdry they, they made me feel. It's like you get this wonderful woman, or at least you imagine she's wonderful when, when you meet her on Tinder, but then you go to the coffee shop and meet, and you start talking, and you just feel, ugh, ugh, ugh. So Hugh Hewitt in 2012 wrote, if it's not close, they can't cheat. Crushing the Democrats in every election and why your life depends on it. Then there's two books here by John Fund, Stealing Elections, How Voter Fraud Threatens Our Democracy. That came out in 2009. And then in 2012, John Fund teamed up with Hans von Spakovsky. Who's counting how fraudsters and bureaucrats put your vote at risk? So if voter fraud was the big serious problem that Republicans claim, you'd think they'd try to make a serious case for it. But instead, it's disappointing to me as a loyal Republican, a loyal right winger, but uh, they just put forward these clowns like Steve Cortez, John Fund, Chris Kobach, Hans von Spakovsky. I mean, how bad is John Fund? Right In the second paragraph of his 2009 book, Stealing Elections, how voter fraud threatens our democracy, he writes, at least eight of the 19 hijackers who attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were actually able to register to vote in either Virginia or Florida while they made their deadly preparations for 9-11. Uh, do you realize how ridiculous that is? 
There was absolutely no rational reason for the 9-11 hijackers to register to vote. There was no evidence that they did so. There's no reason to believe that they were eligible to vote as they were not American citizens. There's no rational reason for individuals in general to try to commit individual vote fraud in America because the penalties they face are so severe and the odds that their individual votes will change elections are so tiny. In um, training rural people on how to use absentee ballots, charge them with criminal kinds of fraud. Um, and again, that they weren't convicted. These were, this was a kind of initiative that was launched by the Reagan Justice Department, same name. So Bush too comes in, uses the old name, puts it together. What does it consist of? It consists of pulling all the U.S. attorneys into the program. They had to designate a district um, representative. They went through, they pulled them all to Washington. They went through a training. It was supposed to be looking for both fraud and voter intimidation, which is more what the Justice Department has done in the past in, in terms of uh, implementing civil rights laws and the voting rights laws is to look for voter intimidation and to protect vulnerable voters from that kind of activity. So this was sort of launched as a, um, as a campaign that would do both, so it was sort of neutral. It, it had nothing to do with looking at voter intimidation. It was all about looking for voter fraud and whether they were naive about, about this as I was, must be out there, you hear about it so much, must be out there, um, that you know, in the end, they, they, I looked at um, uh, this program and in the first three years of the program, they had 95 indictments, which actually isn't a lot. Of the 95 indictments, um, half of them really weren't, indi they weren't indicting voters. They were indicting either election officials or other people, and they were sort of lumping it all together and trying to come up with numbers every three months of how many indictments and so forth. And in the end, they um, convicted 26 voters. Uh, 20 of them were um, people who had, had felony convictions and had voted, not realizing in many cases that, in fact, they weren't eligible to vote because they might have still been under probation in the states they were living in. You couldn't do that. Um, I actually went out to Milwaukee to interview, interview a guy who um, had been indicted but not convicted. And the reason he wasn't convicted is because about a week before he was gonna, his case was going to go to trial, he was represented by uh, sort of legal services people in, in, in the Federal Defenders Program in Milwaukee. His lawyer discovered that he had actually used an ID card to register to vote because in Wisconsin you can register on election day. And because he had been in prison, he was living at his aunt's house in transition. He was a, he was a very uh, low, you know, low income guy. He had a high school uh, diploma. He had voted, he said, every election from the time he was 18. He was probably in his mid-40s. But because he'd been in jail and then he had come out, he didn't have a place to live, um, he, his aunt came back on election day. She said, you know, Derek, you have to come. You have to vote. It's important to vote. And he thought, well, I don't have any ID. What ID should I use? And he remembered that he had his prison ID card. And it had his picture on it. It had his name. And, you know, he, and he brought a letter from his probation officer that showed his address. And he went to, to the school and he presented this. He said, I am so-and-so. Here's my ID card. Here's my parole letter showing where I live at my aunt's house. They registered him to vote, and they wrote that the form of ID he presented was a, was a state ID card, prison ID card. So this guy was caught up in part of the investigation in Milwaukee by one of the Bush Department, uh, Justice Department appointees. So I have no problem with making uh, voting challenging, somewhat uh, difficult. I certainly have no problem with uh, denying felons the right to vote. So I, I have many disagreements with Lorraine Minity and, and the left. But her, her scholarship seems pretty solid. And uh, every time you hear of one ir irregularity or several irregularities, you then get, you know, all sorts of explanations. You get stories of fraud, you know, faxed out as press releases by one political party. And uh, as soon as you yell voter fraud, right, it's a, an immediate attention getter. Like, what would you rather watch? A video that tells you that voter fraud decided the 2020 election or a long, boring video that tries to take apart all the fraudulent allegations that fraud decided the 2020 election, right? The news media, it loves scandal. It loves corruption. It loves a fight. And it's much more exciting and it's going to grab much more eyeballs than doing the plotting, difficult, exhausting work of uh, looking for the facts. So... Let's look at this oft-repeated allegation of voter fraud made by John Fund, Wall Street Journal columnist and author. He proclaimed in his 2004 book, Stealing Elections, that several of the 9-11 hijackers were registered to vote. He asserted at least eight of the 19 hijackers who attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were actually able to register to vote in either Virginia or Florida while they made their deadly preparations for 9-11. And he kept up the claim in the 2009 edition of his book. And his source for the claim was a December 22, 2002 interview he said he conducted with Michael Chertoff, then an assistant attorney general in charge of the Justice Department Criminal Division. So other than that, he, he provided you know, no supporting evidence.
So we're just supposed to take him, take him on his word, right? He doesn't b b bother you know, looking for supporting evidence for for his claims. So he's a regular columnist for a national newspaper, and he he writes this inflammatory propaganda because when you say voter fraud, it just immediately grabs people's attention. They don't think through how how strong is your evidence so in his book john fund writes the hijackers were actually able to register to vote he does not write that they did register to vote or were registered to vote but what does it mean to say someone is able to register to vote i mean you could theoretically you could fill out a voter registration form for your cat or dog but i'd like to see them show up on election day and try to vote or even to vote through the mail and uh, Diane Ravitch, a senior at the Hoover Institute, wrote, uh, no, observe, no reporter prior to John Fun observed that hijackers were eligible to vote in state and federal elections despite the fact that they were not American citizens. Now, foreign nationals are not eligible to vote in American elections. Only citizens are eligible to vote. Then you have politicians picking up this phony story that uh, voter registration procedures are so lax that foreign terrorists can successfully apply so he asserted on the floor of the United States Senate that a Pakistani citizen in Greensboro, North Carolina, with links to two of the September 11 hijackers, were indicted by a federal grand jury for having illegally registered to vote. Now, on TV, John Fun gets confused, and he starts uh, changing, changing his story. So he said to Lou Dobbs, October 24, 2004, that eight of the 19 9-11 hijackers did register to vote. Now, what they are referring to is the fact that some of the 9-11 hijackers obtained driver's licenses, and they incorrectly claimed this made them eligible to vote because of the National Voter Registration Act of 1993, which requires that applicants for driver's license be presented with an opportunity to register to vote. But if you're a foreign national, you still don't get to vote. So what's really going on here is that Diane Ravitch and John Fund are essentially talking in code. They're, they're pushing political propaganda. They're reinforcing the idea held by the right-wing partisans that the National Voter Registration Act of 1993 has just completely corrupted our democracy by opening the door wide open to voter fraud, and there's just no evidence for this. So... The author here, Lorraine Minity, assigned a student, a graduate student, like all summer to try to investigate this wild claim that uh, some of the 9-11 hijackers were registered to vote in Virginia or Florida. Absolutely no supporting evidence at all. And John Fund starts out his book on voter fraud with this completely bogus story. And, and these allegations about the 9-11 hijackers being eligible to vote or registered to vote it was widely circulated. It's had a long life given that it's completely spurious. It's been cited on the floor of the House of Representatives. All sorts of Republican politicians have repeated it. So it's so easy to bring these voter fraud charges. Or, or it's just a little bit like McCarthyism, when Senator Joe McCarthy in the 1950s would say, oh, I know for a fact that there are 313 communists in the American State Department, and he's just making up these numbers, and there's no way to verify his claims. So you get these wild voter fraud charges and then to provide some scrutiny for them takes quite a bit of effort but people can make up charges and distribute these wild allegations you know with much more ease than it takes to investigate and debunk them so wild voter fraud charges get inserted into public discourse then you get argumentation based on demonstrably false information or no information at all then it's entered into the congressional record. It's there to sway lawmakers and then get cited by Supreme Court justices as fact. So pundits who, you know, relish the whiff of scandal, who relish you know, pushing people's buttons, will try to manipulate public understanding by you know, bringing up these bogus allegations. November 2006, John Fund is a guest on Glenn Beck's CNN show. So two years have now passed since the publication of his book, and he's still repeating this bogus charge that eight of the 19 
9-11 hijackers were registered to vote. And this is how he explained it. Well, we have something called the motor voter law. You can go into any government office building, any transaction you conduct with them, driver's license, unemployment, whatever you get the check. You want to register to vote. All the registrations are on a postcard. There's no question as to whether you're a citizen. So this is voter fraud politics, the use of spurious or exaggerated voter fraud allegations to persuade the public about the need for more administrative burdens on the vote. So who are the actors in this fraud? Who are the targets? What are the tactics deployed? What are the factors that account for their success? That's uh, the subject of this excellent book, The Myth of Voter Fraud by Lorraine Minnitis. There, who was a U.S. attorney. Uh, they were running up this pilot pro program in Milwaukee to catch people in this man's position as an ex-felon. And as, as the, uh, one of the people involved in this program told another interviewer, um, they, what they were trying to do in picking up people like this was to see what, what works with juries on cases like this. They wanted to prosecute people like him. Use your tax dollars to go after this guy who didn't do anything wrong. Um, so, Laponius Meridius Maximus, I didn't just read a book about it, bro. I read six books about it. And Laponius, did you know that my classic, The History of X, 100 Years of Sex and Film, that was peer-reviewed by historian Vern Bullo at the prestigious California State University, Northridge. Not only did I read six books on this topic, I also looked at some academic papers and, bro... I listened to some podcasts with academic experts. And I also read the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street Journal. I mean, this is what I'm doing for you. <laughs> Eleanor Goldschmidt, I want to carry Luke's baby. <laughs> yeah, most people don't even bother to read one book, Laponius Maximus Meridius. They just go with their gut feeling. Well, you can't always intuit these things. You just can't get it using your, your common sense. <laughs> but I'm willing to do the work for you. You know, this is all in talking about some of the research that I did. It was, it was, a, it was actually quite surprising to me how difficult it was to try to collect this information. And I, I, I can really say I went at this in a neutral position. I probably thought there was a lot. I didn't think it would be that hard to find it. And the more I tried and the more I looked, the more I came, became convinced that just, this just doesn't happen. This just doesn't happen. That, you know, political scientists know this. It's uh, hard to get people to vote once, let alone twice. Um, so you need a conspiracy, right, to, to really kind of have an impact through fraud. You need a conspiracy. Once you have a conspiracy, you've got a lot of points of access for law enforcement. And in fact, in the past, the federal government, when it has prosecuted election fraud, and, and you know, at the time I was doing this research, they were involved, the Justice Department was involved in breaking up some vote buying schemes in rural Kentucky and West Virginia that were you know, somewhat of a way of life there. Um, but it has to do with exploitation of poor people and conspiracies. I mean, the, the ringleader in, uh, in that case, one of those cases, um, was a millionaire coal mine owner, coal mine operator. Um, when there's conspiracies, the government has prosecuted them. The government can find it. They can uh, prosecute it. Okay, so what about Chris Kobach? He's one of the people pushing these allegations of voter fraud. Well, he took uh, one case when he was the Secretary of State for the state of Kansas. He took one case to the Supreme Court. And after a whole series of mistakes in district court, he was found in contempt. He was ordered to take six hours of remedial legal training on civil procedure. So, uh, I mean, the guy's, the guy's a buffoon. I mean, his courtroom performance was so, so pathetic that uh, he was ordered to take all this remedial education. All right, uh, Ann Coulter writes in her column here on voter fraud john ashcroft's case john Af ashcroft absolutely had a senate seat stolen from him in year 2000 when a state judge ordered polls in heavily democratic st louis to remain open for an extra three hours republicans didn't even hear about it for another hour despite an appellate court striking down the ridiculously lawless order st louis was given an extra three and a half hours to kick out tens of thousands of additional votes ashcroft lost the election by 49,000 votes well, surprisingly, Ann Coulter's not telling the truth here about what happened. And even if everything she just said there was true, a judge ordering polling places to stay open for an extra three hours is not voter fraud. That's the system working or not working. Obviously, common sense suggests it's generally in the Republicans' interest to make uh, voting fairly challenging and onerous, particularly for groups that are not likely to vote for them. 
And it's in Democrats' interest to be able to open up opportunities and make it as easy as possible for their their voters to get out the vote. But competing within the system, that that's not voter fraud. And even John Ashcroft did not believe that voter fraud decided the election. He, he did not challenge the results because the margin of victory was 49,000 votes. He discouraged other Republicans from challenging the outcome of the election. And uh, John Ashcroft said, I reject any legal challenge to this election. I believe the will of the people has been expressed. The people should be respected and heard. So on election night, some Republicans claimed that Democrats had an unfair advantage when polls in heavily Democratic St. Louis were kept open 45 minutes later than in the rest of the state. So the judge ordered the polls to remain open an additional three hours, but a state appellate court overturned her ruling and the polls were closed just before 8 p.m. Then Ann Coulter writes about Washington State 2004, the gubernatorial election there, just a razor thin margin for the Democrat. And uh, she talks about how Democratic King County began finding misplaced ballots. Well, where are Democratic strongholds? Generally speaking, they are in inner cities where the people who administer the voting there uh, may not be our best and brightest. And also, they tend to be underfunded, under-resourced, under-educated, and overwhelmed. So, yes, generally speaking, votes in heavily Democratic areas take much longer to count, and they're much more likely to misplace ballots because they're simply not as efficient, they're not as smart, they're not as competent, they're not as educated. But finding ballots is not in and of itself evidence of voter fraud. So we have five American states that exclusively use mail-in balloting. We don't have any evidence that they've had a higher percentage of voter fraud than other states. So it was a complicated case, and uh, there were you know ballots found, and so it all ended up in a lawsuit, right? And the Republicans got to enter into ev evidence everything that they wanted to enter into evidence, so they weren't denied. Finally, the judge ruled, and the Republicans were quite happy with this judge. And finally, he ruled the Republican Party did not provide enough evidence that the disputed votes were ineligible or for whom they were cast was enough to overturn the election. He did find that there was evidence that 1,678 votes had been illegally cast throughout the state. Now, that doesn't mean it's knowing fraud. It can be incompetence. It can be people mail-in balloting sending in a ballot by mail, and then voting in person to make sure that their vote counts. He declined to nullify the election, and he rejected claims of uh, sufficient voter fraud to decide the election. He stated the court is more inclined to believe that the Democrat would have prevailed under a statistical analysis theory, rejecting the Republican claim that improperly cast ballots led to the Democrats' victory. So he did accept the claim that some people voted illegally. So anything that is human is going to have fraud, right? Some people are not going to follow the rules. So there was little proof which candidate benefited from those votes. So his ruling was a comprehensive defeat for the Republicans. The judge admitted nearly every piece of evidence the Republican Party offered. Then he wrote a thorough, tough opinion rejecting Republican claims while simultaneously criticizing the administration of the election, particularly in King County. So a lot of these Democratic strongholds are incompetent right there's there are, you know abundant reasons to to criticize them on the basis of competency now Ann Coulter writes about Al Franken's victory 2008 in Minnesota so Senator Norm Coleman won his re-election bid in 2008 against challenger Al Franken by 725 votes but that's only on election night Right, Democratic strongholds, remember, typically take longer to count their votes because they are less competent and uh, they typically have less resources than more affluent areas. So day by day, votes were added to Al Franken's column. Random error would not continually benefit only one side and said yes, but it makes sense that in Democratic strongholds, it's going to take longer to count the votes. So there was a legal battle that lasted over eight months. But uh, in the end, Al Franken was uh, declared the winner. And there's no evidence to believe that fraud decided that election. 
when it's an individual who goes to vote not understanding the rules because they're not explained to them, um, this is not the kind of problem that uh, you know, the governor of Texas should address as an emergency issue, which he has done this year, putting emergency legislation through in Texas uh, to try to bring more stringent voter ID rules to Texas. I mean, this is, there is this momentum and urgency in the states right now, and Mark's absolutely right, at least probably half the states um, have pushed through where, they, where you have Republican Party control, usually of the entire government there, so they can ram these things through. They have been trying to do this now for, for a number of years, um, and it failed where they've had governors who won't sign the bills and so forth. But where you have this sort of unified control, uh, these things are going through, as they recently did in Ohio. Um, so, you know, I, I, as I said, I sort of first started out trying to document it, and it was this incredibly difficult thing to do. I did the best I could to simply say, shouldn't there be an imprint? If you're saying there's some kind of criminal behavior going on, shouldn't there be an imprint? People will say to me, well, but it's fraud. It's designed not to be detected. I said, well, isn't all crime designed not to be detected? You know, and we find it. And you know, to make that point, um, I looked up, um, I had this, uh, one of the data sets that I was able to access was a database of all of the federal indictments brought in district court level, um, in the appellate court level, all federal indictments. And this is, you know, these are somewhere close to 200,000 indictments a year brought, brought by the federal government. And I looked through all of that and tried to find anybody being indicted for anything related to uh, some kind of election fraud. And so, for example, in fiscal year 2005, looking at this data, there were 60 indictments. These were just indictments of people who uh, had, there was, where there was something to do with elections. Now, most of these indictments, because I, I then had to go and look up all of the indictments, most of them were for campaign finance violations by politicians. They're coded in this data set as elections. So keep that in mind, but still we're talking 60 indictments, not convictions, indictments. Um, how does that compare to other kinds of fraud that might be committed? Well, um, there were 1,980 indictments for social security fraud. Okay, so don't talk to me about voter fraud, guys, unless you know about modular voting architecture, vertical proximity effects, security vulnerabilities, and problems with VVPT, voter verifiable paper trail, and rational and pluralistic models of Harvard implementation. If this stream is consistently about one thing, it's about rational and pluralistic models of Harvard implementation. So I recommend this book, The Myth of uh, Voter Fraud. Have I ever committed didgeridoo fraud? Well, I've, I've played air didgeridoo. <laughs> Luke, you surprised me. You seem to be a follower and believer in the decadent neoliberal quasi-capitalistic American system. Yes, as compared to the other alternatives, like wh which are the better alternatives? I would not like to live under other systems like North Korea's or systems in Africa or Russia or China. So yeah, compared to the available political systems, I prefer the American one. So there's definitely some problems in America, but uh, I don't want to throw America away, bro. Wow, Eleanor Goldschmidt's in San Francisco. Okay, well, well send me an email and uh, we'll have to get to know each other a little bit better. And I think Perhaps we could grow together Jewishly. Like we could talk about our favorite Torah portions. So, uh, Eleanor, do, do you do you have a, a favorite Torah portion? I think I like Mishpatim. False argument, Luke. Okay, what's false about it? Give me a superior system. Perhaps you'd prefer to be governed by like ancient Aboriginal law or the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, we'll get together and play the didgeridoo. Maybe Eleanor appreciates uh, my my finely attuned musical skills, right? I, I'm not I'm not afraid to to play the didgeridoo. I'm not afraid to grow Jewishly. I'm not afraid to grow emotionally. I'm not afraid to grow spiritually and psychologically and musically and athletically. If this show is about anything, it's about athletic, spiritual, moral, philosophical psychological, personal, and athletic growth, right? If we're about anything, I think that's that's what we're about. So let's, let's look at the great news here. What's going on in state capitals? Republicans enjoy unmatched power in the states. It was a 40-year effort. You, you might think all oh, the news is bad for Republicans. Well, over the past 40 years, Republicans have quietly gained overwhelming power in state legislatures. So look at the difference between 1980 and 2020. So Democratic power in the states largely resides on the coasts. 
right? The upper northeast here and the west coast. So even after the 1980 election, when Ronald Reagan was first elected president, Democrats controlled most state houses, 29 to 15. After the 2020 election, the numbers nearly reversed. Republicans controlled 30 state legislatures. Democrats hold only 18. So how did the GOP make such big gains? Well, what they did is they spun a bunch of conspiracy theories. They, they, they got copium and hopium. And no, actually, they did the hard work. It wasn't that they decided, oh, our opponents are all demons. There's nothing we can do. Uh, our opponents are just malevolent. There's nothing we can do. No, they accepted reality and they got to work. So for decades prior to 1980, Democrats were the stronger brand in state houses. Conservative Dems had locked down the South. Blue collar Dems locked down the upper Midwest. The liberals held coastal strongholds. So the Democrats simply had the bigger tent, but that began to change in the 1980. So the Republicans built up self-reliant state parties. The Republican brand improved under Ronald Reagan, particularly in the South. Republicans slowly, steadily built up fundraising and organizing capacities in Democratic strongholds, then waited for those gains to pay off. When was the tipping point? Newt Gingrich and the contract with America and the 1994 congressional elections, a national referendum on President Bill Clinton and the Democrats. So Gingrich attacked Clinton for moving too far left on issues such as taxes and health health care. He rolled out a contract with America and uh, Republicans became the party of ideas again. So this resulted in some impressive gains. So after the 1994 election, GOP held both chambers in 19 states. In 2010, when Barack Obama was facing his midterm election, the Tea Party was on the rise. Republicans made more gains. So the Republicans created a strategy using folks at the very top of their party to create outsized investments in state legislatures. They spent $30 million. They got the best return on investment for a political dollar imaginable. After the 2010 midterms, Republicans were no longer competitive in state capitals. They were dominant. They had full control over 25 state legislatures. Democrats were left with only 16 states. GOP hit its peak of 32 states in 2016. Right now, they dominate 30 to 18. And how did they do that? Hard work, organization, discipline, living in reality. That's how things get done. There were 6,658 indictments for false claims, simply making false claims. There were 3,161 indictments for counterfeiting. There were 6,929 indictments for postal internet and wire fraud. So fraud can be detected, crime can be detected. Um, the, the federal government, governments, law enforcement uh, uh, officials have ways of, of doing it. And with respect to elections, that's the whole point of the registration system is to prevent fraud. That's why you register beforehand. That's where registration comes from. The whole history of uh, imposing registration laws is, uh, was at the time claimed to be uh, an anti-fraud measure as well. So that's why we have that, so that, that people are identified beforehand. Um, and then we have, states have lots of different rules about how you identify yourself at the polls. Um, but, and, and no system is perfect. Like I said, no, I don't say it never happens. And there, there isn't, uh, you know, there aren't sort of malevolent people out there or people who want to play games and tricks and things like that. I mean, there's so many cases of, you know, people registering their poodle, People, you know, seeing if they can scam the system and then using that and saying, oh, it was easy, you know, I, I could register my poodle. It's like, well, did your poodle vote? I mean, that's what we want to know. Um, so, and how did he vote? It's true. There's, I mean, a lot, a lot of these cases, it turns out that people who've been, who have been caught have voted for Republicans. Like, for example, in the 2004 um, governor's race in Washington, that was a very hotly, you know, closely contested race. It went through a couple of recounts. Um, and actually, fraud allegations didn't emerge right away in that case. They, they came out later when, when they realized they really were going to lose, that this judge you know, that they had, that the Republicans had kind of helped pick, uh, or that, not that they had picked him, but they were very happy with him uh, when, when he got assigned the case. They thought they were going to win, win that case. Um, and, you know, the Democrats went out and they found, um, they found people who had received absentee ballots who had felony records and had sent them in because they thought, you're sending me a ballot. You must want me to send it back in. You know, if I'm not eligible to vote, why are you sending me a ballot? And they were able to find a number of people who admitted in, basically in affidavits that they had voted for Republicans. Even though, so actually the, the final vote tally in that case was reduced by four because the judge said, well, there actually were four fraudulent voters here. You know, fraudulent meaning they had violated the rules about uh, who can vote based on that, that felony conviction issue. So 
So, you know, so the book starts that way. And then I, I just, you know, I kept scratching my head about how to connect what I was hearing about fraud rampant. And now, you know, the, the, the attack on ACORN begins. Um, and it, it begins when ACORN in Florida decides that they are going to try to um, uh, go through the, the election process to get to raise the minimum wage because they can't get it through the state legislature because legislature is controlled by the Republicans. So. Okay, you're probably wondering what the hell is going on with Spain and is it good for the Jews? Our supreme obligation to fight for Spain and for Europe now weak and liquidated by the enemy. The enemy will always be the same, although with different bars, the Jews. Because there is nothing more certain than this statement. The Jew is the guilty one. The Jew is the guilty one. And the blue division fought against this. Made the European free of communism from Jewish intention. And toward the disobedience against the ideal of the nation. Whoa, got to disavow. And here she is leading a Nazi salute. Josh Feldberg tweets, please ask Twitter to ban her and other Spanish Nazis. Why isn't this illegal? How is this legal in 2021? Whoa. Anti-communista. Must be anti-Semitic. Okay, I know what you want, and it's time to give to you what you want. But first, here's Boris Johnson on IQ. That there is no return to that spirit of loads of money heartlessness, figuratively riffling banknotes under the noses of the homeless. And this time, I hope that the Gordon Geckos of London are conspicuous not just for their greed. And I accept the CPS view that greed is a valid motivator of economic progress as for what they give and do for the rest of the population. It was Margaret Thatcher who made the key observation about charity in her famous analysis of the parable of the Good Samaritan. He wouldn't have been much use to the chap who fell amongst thieves, she noted, the Good Samaritan, if he had not been rich enough to help. Britain is competing in an increasingly impatient and globalised economy in which the competition is getting ever stiffer. And no one can ignore the harshness of that competition or the inequality that it inevitably accentuates. And I'm afraid that violent economic centrifuge is operating on human beings who are already very far from equal in raw ability, if not in spiritual worth. Whatever you may think of the value of IQ tests, it is surely relevant to a conversation about equality that as many as 16% of our species have an IQ below 85, while about 2%, but anyway, 16% of you want to put up your hands? 16% have an IQ below below 85, uh, 2% have an IQ above 130. Okay, so he's talking here about the European mean, and this is Boris Johnson in 2013. He got into quite a bit of trouble for this talk. And the harder you shake the pack, the easier... So this is the third Margaret Thatcher lecture. ...easy it will be for some cornflakes to get to the top. And for one reason or another, uh, boardroom greed, or as the people in the boardrooms assure me, the natural and God-given talents of, uh, of, of senior executives, the income gap between the top cornflakes and the bottom cornflakes is getting wider than ever. And I stress, I don't believe that economic equality is possible. Indeed, some measure of inequality is essential for the spirit of envy and keeping up with the Joneses and so on. That is a valuable spur to economic activity. We may not have gunboats anymore as we did in the days when we invaded or conquered 171 members of the UN, but we hardly need gunboats anymore because we are already fulfilling what I think of our destiny as the soft power, the soft power capital of the world. And that, to conclude, is very largely thanks to a woman who knew all about soft power and hard power and above all, about the deep Freudian terror 
that every man possesses for the inner recesses of a handbag. Okay, that, that is brilliant there by Boris Johnson. Some comments on Steve Saylor's blog. Uh, Boris must have heard that classic rhetorical advice and about what it is necessary to always deliver to your audience. Delights and insights. I mean, that's what this show is all about. If this show is about any one thing, it's about delivering delights and insights. And his Freud meta joke. So he transformed transforms Freud's penis envy theorem. All right. And uh, he looks at all the men who are turned into little boys by Margaret Thatcher and lets them shrink even more by characterize them as terrorized and traumatized by the recesses, the huge empty space of Margaret Thatcher's handbag. So Boris Johnson lets the men that Mrs. Thatcher dwarfed shiver over the imagination of a symbol, the handbag of her sex's sexual strength, which is receding the recesses, the big style inwards, just like her, just like the vagina does, making the little boys little penises in this dark and horrific tale absolutely lost. Strong argument to be made that the coming waves of artificial intelligence will be much harder on the administrative middle and even upper middle classes than on hands-on working class because many legal procedures, medical diagnostics, routine business transactions, and so on will soon become easier to automate and the reign of the midwit symbol manipulators will be undermined. So more and more people exhausted by the thin virtuality of social media will become obsessed with having authentic day-to-day -day experiences. And so they will seek out and pay for authentic artisanal interactions, not just in restaurants and bars, but also in shopping, in healthcare, and so on. You can see this happening now with food, products that can be marketed as the products of personalized curating and care. They command premium prices. So this is bound to spread. So Boris Johnson's presentation is quite a bit more intelligent than what we get from American politicians. You need some inequality to make people compete and to produce, and you need winners to milk. There's no milk if no one's gone milking. There is a natural inequality of talent. About one-sixth of the population is really stupid and can't contribute much. A very small fraction of the population has the smarts to grab opportunities and grab outsized rewards. Worldwide economic competition is heating up. There are fewer protected areas. So this heightened competition sorts on natural ability even more than ever before. Good stuff there from Boris Johnson. I, I kind of cracked it. And I don't think the left acts exactly like this because you could say, oh, well, you're just describing every political movement or whatever. I, I don't quite agree with that. Um, in the sense that the left, to their credit, they have developed ways of being hegemonic in the way that the right isn't. And, and what I mean by that is that the New York Times is the New York Times. Like the New York Times is news and analysis. And it, yeah, of course, it's all a bunch of liberals, probably 90% of them at least. And, and probably a growing percentage of them aren't even liberals anymore. They're leftist and whatever. Uh, but it is hegemonic in the sense that it is able to frame what's important for Americans. And so it kind of acts in that older way that the Nightly News Act acted and so on. It, it is hegemonic. It is propaganda in the way that Jackie Lul described propaganda. Um, conservatives have conservative media. So their media kind of inherently has this inferiority complex. It's always like punching up at the liberals. And I really don't know of a counterexample to that. You know, I mean, like, is, is there anything approaching the equivalent of the New York Times among conservative media? Maybe Fox News is a thing that almost gets there because they will do original reporting and kind of at least present themselves as kind of objective or something. But that's it. And I would say the way that the, the media is moving or flowing is towards a kind of heightened partisanship and kind of heightened conservative media-based stuff. They don't want to be hegemonic. They want to punch up at hegemony. And um, so I, I do think the left and the right are, are asymmetric in that sense. I mean, again, academia, you want to complain about there are all these left-wing professors. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there are. You are right. It's probably 75% of them in the humanities and maybe even a lot in the hard sciences. Might even be higher than that. Uh, but, and it's probably growing higher in terms of the you know, millennials and Gen Xers who are becoming professors now as they enter their 40s and 50s. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's because academia is an extremely conservative institution. It is a small C conservative. It, it is a establishment gratifying, you know, institution. And the reason why liberals are there is that they are part of a hegemonic ideology. They aren't endlessly with this kind of superior inferiority complex and endlessly punching up at the liberals. They're punching down. 
And, mm. uh, w- w- you know, if we want to change this, we need to recognize this asymmetry and not just claim that, you know, like, oh, there's, there, you know, maybe the, we can start a new conservative webzine and people start gravitating to that. You know, we, we need to kind of recognize what the real problem is and recognize like the way reality is structured as opposed to, again, just complain about it endlessly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as we uh, keep coming back to a lot of the, well, probably all of the problems stem from refusing to re- recognize reality as it is. Yeah. And, you know, as far as education goes in academia, these these types of things, the right has developed into, and perhaps always has been, an anti-intellectual movement. Yeah. And if you're anti-intellectual, how do you expect to control an intellectual institution? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> generally speaking, evolution has moved towards bigger brains. You know, mm-hmm. we began as fishes and then we crawled out of the sea and we were dinosaurs and <laughs> then we became apes. I mean, obviously, this is I'm being a little bit ridiculous here, but you get my point. Now, it doesn't always happen like that. Um, you know, insects have their own evolution and uh, plants have an evolution that's later than, uh, I think plants came in like in the midpoint of the age of dinosaurs, if I'm not incorrect. So there are ways of creating life that are not more intelligent in our terms. Now, a plant is, you know, just as intelligent in some ways in the sense of adapting to its environment and maneuvering through it and finding a way to exist and so on. But just in, in our, from our standards of, you know, being intelligent, having a psyche and being, ha- having self-consciousness and self-awareness and so on that, that, you know, that's what I mean. The plants are not like that. <laughs> Maybe they are. <laughs> no. uh, but uh, what I mean is like the general tendency is towards them. I remember yesterday when I was playing excerpts from this interview and uh, Richard says that uh, nationalism is a ship magnet. I just don't think that's true. Nationalism brings out all types. There's nothing inherent about nationalism that makes it a ship magnet. Now, maybe white nationalism in the United States of America has, say, disproportionately attracted antisocial people because of the unique conditions of America. And I I don't think uh, white nationalism is a coherent, viable path forward because people don't identify primarily as white. People identify as Australian or as American or Canadian. So American nationalism, Canadian nationalism, Australian nationalism, English nationalism, which does have a racial component, that is a coherent path forward. But I don't think there's anything about, say, English nationalism that's inherently a ship magnet or anything inherently about American nationalism or Australian nationalism that's a ship magnet. It was interesting. uh, Earlier in this interview, Richard said that uh, he disavows white nationalism. So has he changed his mind? And and what exactly does he stand for? So Richard's become very similar to liberal talking heads uh, on CNN. So has he completely changed his thinking to try to fit in with the shrinking terms of service on the major forms of social media? I, I just wonder if his desire to remain on the major forms of social media has taken his thinking and just shoved it into a much smaller box? Has he undergone some some genuine change? It's just interesting. He's gone from someone who's, you know, completely out there to to someone who who could very well uh, go on CNN. I mean, how how, how did he make these changes? I wanted to do that, but I did it. So here we go. Let's let's make make the best of it. This and it doesn't always happen like this. Sometimes just simply the most brutal or the most efficient, or maybe even you could say the dumbest, are going to win. Um, but we don't li- like once we've entered, once we pass that Rubicon of humanity and self consciousness and religion, etc. The most clever are going. The cleverest will dominate the least cleverest. Those people who are most sophisticated with language and symbol and meaning and persuasion and demoralization and psychology writ large are the ones who are going to dominate those who aren't. Yeah. So it, it just is what it is. We don't live in some 
I, I don't know, some like time where you just need the, the toughest dudes to win. In that case, yeah, I bet on the whole, I mean, it, it's a bit self-serving for conservatives to say this, but I bet on the whole, conservatives are just kind of more, they're, they're tougher. Uh, they're more kind of pragmatic in certain ways. You know, a conser someone who's conservative minded is probably a lot better at starting a small business. You know, I, I agree with that, fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not really what we're dealing with. Uh, once you are part of this human experiment, uh, you are engaging on the level of the psyche and on the level of meaning and psychology and, and moralization and demoralization and symbol and literature and art and propaganda, etc. And you will lose if you are the least sophisticated. You will be dominated by others, period. So maybe it's all going to collapse. No, it's, and, it's, it's I mean, this is another conservative you to try right call that girl that I uh, used to have a crush on. Why? You think we can get her on? Well, I got a number for her. She's out on the West Coast. You want to do it tomorrow or you want to do it now? Well, no, I just thought we'd do, do it early. This is how we're calling an old right. girlfriend. Yeah. Like now she might girl just be had waking a up. Crush on in summer camp. Hmm. All right. Just quickly dial the All right, quickly. You get, see if she'll come on the air. T tell her Howard Stern. I'm sure she remembers the name. Oh, <laughs> you leave an indelible impression wherever you go. In case you don't know what we're talking about, there was some girl I was talking about before that when I was a kid growing up in summer camp looked like Connie Selica. Supposedly looked like Connie yeah. She did. Every guy wanted her. I couldn't get her. She never would pay attention to me. I want to know if she's aware of me. <laughs> I wonder if she's aware that I had a crush on her. Hi, can I please speak to Debbie? Hi, Debbie. This is Gary from Howard Stern's office in New York. Will you come on the air with us? Okay, hold on. Hmm. What did she say? She said her cousin just called her. She thinks the whole thing's hysterical. <laughs> oh boy. Mm, she's a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> All these broads who never would give me the time of day. Hi, Debbie. Hello. How you doing? I'm fine. I just mentioned your name a couple of days ago. Really? Yes, because you're the only person I know from Camp Wellness right. that I know your whereabouts. Not only do you know my whereabouts, but I'm probably one of the most famous guys in America. That may well be. I didn't even hear what you said about me. I said I was talking about Connie Selica. Your name, yeah. You know what? You know what? I haven't talked about you on the air on purpose because, quite frankly, any good-looking girl that I knew when I grew up, uh -huh. I don't want to give them the satisfaction of me saying on the air that they were good-looking. Ah, uh, uh, that, that would be satisfaction for them. And Debbie was always a very nice girl, don't get me wrong, but uh, never gave me the time of day. And she Is that knew true? She, you, know, you never... You were Big Howie, and then there was Little Howie. Yeah, and uh, I noticed that uh, Big Howie and Little Howie never got any action. You know. <laughs> but you, of course, you never looked at me when I was as a, as a boyfriend potential, and uh, I understand it. I'm an ugly guy. Well, you know what? What? I'm a very innocent girl at Camp Wellness. Well, I don't know how innocent you were. You certainly weren't interested in me uh, as a boyfriend. And now I just want to say, hey, I'm, I'm famous. Are you married? Why? I am married. I have a seven-year-old boy. He goes to the Brandeis Hill Jewish Day School here in Marin County. What are you, what are you a, a super... Give you a resume? What are you, a super Jew? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, man, happy, I'm a happy mom and wife. I'll say that. Well, I bet you would have been a lot happy on my arm. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Going to celebrity parties and such. Uh, what celebrity parties what? do you go to? Be quiet, Robin. <laughs> what is that, Robin? How do you look? Did you look tall? I said, what I was on the air talking about, saying how you look like Connie Selica. Well, my coloring is still the same, but I'm grayer than her because I don't color my hair. You don't color your hair? Yeah. I remember you had the biggest, most beautiful jugs. And I don't have those anymore either. What do you mean you don't have them? Did you have a mastectomy? No, hardly. I, um, I am a lot smaller in person than I was when you knew me. I weigh a lot less than I weighed then. Really? You have a better body now? Um, well, I got a tighter body now. Hopefully it's better. But uh, oh. I don't have the same thing on top after I nursed my child for 10 months. I sold those moms. Oh, there, man. You were so hot when I knew this girl. Forget about it. I would have done anything to bang her or have her as a girlfriend. <laughs> Anything. Because you I knew, liked Howard, didn't no, you? No, she liked me as a friend, like all the other girls. I'm talking to her. Howard was a very funny guy. Yeah, very funny. Big buffoon, big clown. But what if you said, you know, hey, I'd like to take you out on a date? She would have said no. Ugh, I'm asking her. I know. You I know what, Robin? I can't tell that we didn't go on dates. We all hung out. We lied. Yeah, but I was at your house. Tonight. I was at your house. Were you? Yeah, and there were boyfriends and girlfriends and stuff, and you never would look at me. I know that. I never would ask you to be my girlfriend. Uh -huh. What, you knew that I would have liked you as a girlfriend. I'm sure you knew that, right? I'm sure I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I can't say history would have completely been different. I think you're very happy where you are. And excuse me for one. Around. Excuse me for one second, Gary. What time is Senator D'Amato coming on the show tomorrow? Uh, Senator of New York. Uh, what time? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, what does Debbie's husband do? Yeah. What does your husband do, Debbie? Uh, he's a computer programmer at the end of the day, <laughs> and he's a very wonderful guy. <laughs> <laughs> what are you he, laughing about? He's not about? as funny as you. Howard. What kind of money does he make? Good luck. How much? Work hard. What does he make? About hundred. Not as much as you do. What does he make? About hundred. I'd rather not say on nationwide radio. Why don't you call me when he hits five figures? <laughs> he's a very. He's he's doing very nicely. What do you make? About five figures. Have you ever heard me on the radio before? He, he does just fine. He, he makes plenty of money. So How long have you been married? Uh, well, I've been with my husband for almost 17 years. We've been married for 11. Oh, so this is, you've only been married once? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, believe me, if I married her, I wouldn't think about anybody else. Uh, you're so kind, Howard. What a body on you. God, I used to die. I, I would love to talk to you. Not you must send air. us a picture of yourself. Yeah, would you send me a picture of yourself in a bikini? You tell me where to send it. No, All right. I don't wear bikinis. 600 Madison Avenue. Okay. Have any old pictures of yourself when you were about 16? Oh, majors, yeah. Yeah, send me some of those, too. <laughs> and uh, you send them to 600 Madison Avenue, yeah. attention Howard Stern. Yeah. And when are you coming to New York? Do you ever come to actually, New York? Actually, I was in New York last year, and I actually tried to call you just not to be on the air, but just to talk to you to reminisce about Unit 5. Yeah, and... Get through. Oh, you should have called. We could have had a little lunch. Hey, with a wife and hubby. No, with you. Okay. Not with your wife, not with the hubby. <laughs> and I enjoyed your show, too. Oh, you did? What, the TV show? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe one of these days. Well, maybe one of these days, our radio
But listen, I hate to be curt and rude, but I gotta get in the shower. My kids gotta get to oh. age 15. So what are you naked? Hardly. Would you, would you ever wear a thong? You wear no, thong I underpants? Wear that, that's raw stuff. You don't wear thong underpants? No. But you gotta I'm not wear... the kind of guy. I'm a big tennis player guy. I wear tennis underwear. Do you really? Yeah. Do a lot of guys come on to you still? I hope not. I don't notice if they do. Yeah, but a lot of guys think you're attractive, right? I don't know. I can tell you the truth. Man, I would I have done things. Mom, Let me tell I you something. I don't know why. Why when I was a kid? Why when I was a kid you didn't look at me? Why was I that ugly? Was I that much of a gork? <laughs> Tell the truth. Tell me, tell me what you really thought of me when I was a kid. You were a very funny guy. But you never looked at me sexually, right? Well, that's probably right. Yeah. Nobody I, mean, I don't remember who I was looking at sexually at that age anyway. No, you had boyfriends. I, I remember. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I bet everyone on the tennis court gets a boner when you get on there. Hardly, girl. Boy, excuse me. Uh, girl, say. <laughs> well, I live in the Bay Area. Who does your husband look like? Is your husband really good looking? Uh, yeah, he, he was born in Israel. He's very dark. He's, he's... He married an Israeli. Oh, Jesus. But he left when he was four, so he's really an American kind of guy. He's no, he's not American. Guy. He's Israeli. You gotta marry a foreigner. A uh, foreigner? So really, I have a wonderful husband, and I got a great life, and I'm a very happy girl. And... Well, I'll try to make you miserable. You come see me. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for calling. You should have paid attention to me. Maybe if you go after a guy for personality instead of looks, <laughs> you should pay attention to that. You should pay Actually, attention to that. when I met my husband 17 years ago, I had just stopped eating meat two weeks before, and he was a vegetarian, and I said, ah. No, I don't eat meat. <laughs> you never, you never look at me as a boyfriend. You should have looked at me as a boyfriend. Now you can eat your heart out. I'm a successful guy. I got, my own, I, just signed like a, I got a movie deal with New Line Cinema, two pictures I'm developing simultaneously, and I got a radio show that's going to be national. Good, so send me some freebies out. Yeah, no, I'm not sending you anything. Hey, look at this. I'm still begging. That's unbelievable. And I'm still beating off. Very good. You send me pictures. Send me pictures. Send me pictures. Thanks for calling. Right on. Bye, Robin. Bye, bye. Howard. Give me a kiss. Mm, yeah, there you go. Lachayim, Lachayim. Lachayim, with the Jewish thing. Married an Israeli. I love these good looking girls marry foreigners. <laughs> to me, those Israelis look like Arabs. No, they do look a lot alike. I don't know how they tell each other apart. They can't war. We want to see a picture of her. Oh, man, this girl was so hot. When I was, a kid, I was 16, I would have, this was like being around a movie star. Like. <laughs> I knew older guys. I knew guys in their 40s were looking at her and salivating. She would walk around the camp with no bra, and she had her shirt. You know when the girls take their work shirts and tie them up, yes. and you can see their belly and yeah. wearing shorts? Yeah. I, used to, I, used to, I used to sit there, I'd go, oh, give me oxygen. <laughs> Why do I have to be such an ugly gork? Why can't I be about six foot one and look like uh, Tom Cruise? You weren't six foot one yet. Just, well, I was already six nine when I was in summer camp. <laughs> I was always too tall for my age. <laughs> And awkward and not knowing how to use my body. And a big ugly nose with a bad genetics my parents gave me. Oh, please. Jeez. The bad teeth and the big nose, <laughs> the stupid hair that covered my face. Did you have anything to recommend you? Oh, I have nice eyes. <laughs> mm, great. Oh, Howard, you have really nice eyes. Yeah, what's the recipe? A gargoyle? <laughs> when a girl tells you you got nice eyes, you know what that means? You can't find another thing on you that's appealing. <laughs> I'm a pretty good assessor of what I am. And everybody with the looks and the looks, I'm a great guy. <laughs> Did I've got a great personality. Did Dr. Lou get her? Dr. Lou didn't get her, no. He didn't even get her. And believe me, you would have liked her, too. You asked Dr. Lou. Probably Dr. Lou could have gotten her. Dr. Lou was another good-looking guy. All the girls used to go, oh, Dr. Lou's got a great personality. No, they weren't calling him Dr. They Lou. They were already. Everyone knew he was going to be a doctor. He had straight A's in school. Everyone used to go, hey, he's a great guy. And I go, Lou's got a horrible personality. What about me? i got a great personality. Girl wants to have fun. Why don't you be with me? <laughs> I'm a funny guy. I can make you laugh. <laughs> Nobody ever wants to be with me. I'm raunchy and disgusting. Uh, Howard Stern before his divorce. This is Howard Stern at his peak. He started going downhill once he got divorced in 1999. This is, you know, horny... Howard at his peak. <laughs> I'm a great guy. I'll tell you one thing, boy. Girls with me, she has a lot of fun. Celebrity parties. Yeah, <laughs> celebrity parties. That was pretty and fun. you had to ruin it. <laughs> oh, we went to Joan Rivers last Christmas. <laughs> yeah, one a year. Yeah. yeah, it's more than most girls get to go to. Let's be honest. Well, I get a lot of a lot of invites. <laughs> I would have died for that girl. I would have given my left arm for that girl. She just would have looked at me. But no. Every, oh, I was her clown, her buffoon. I remember I was over there once. There was a bunch of guys all, all doing cartwheels, trying to entertain her. God. Wouldn't look at me. Big ugly gork. That's all right. I'm getting my. I'm getting my. I'm getting my revenge. Ah, uh, I, I, I'm a happening guy now. <laughs> <laughs> I just beat Mark and Brian. <laughs> I got a thing I had against the wall. Oh man, I used to see her walk around the summer camp there. Maybe if she would look at me, no one would look at me. See, you got to hang out with her and tell her jokes and make her laugh. Oh yeah, I was you a big. Never took advantage of these opportunities. Nah, Robin, you know when a girl's even slightly interested, she couldn't even care less. <laughs> I so how do you know when a girl's interested in you? It sh she will do something out of the ordinary. So she'll touch you. She'll ask you an unnecessary question. So hi, how are you? That's not an unnecessary question. But uh, you know, what you do this weekend? Not necessarily an unnecessary question. It might be just a polite question. But if she asks you, oh, did you go see your grandma? Or did you go roller skating? Or have you seen that movie yet? Right. So these are IOIs, indicators of interest. So if she primps in front of you, like she brushes her hair, puts on makeup, any primping in front of you, if she touches you unnecessarily, if she asks you unnecessary questions, these are all IOIs, indicators of interest, and you know that she is interested. I've been, you know, I went and made a play every once in a while for girls who were yeah, really good looking yeah. and thought I was funny. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up just like, you know, please, you know, please, come on, let me kiss you. <laughs> hey, come on, they weren't interested. Girls don't go by appearance. Right, sure. They like do. Guys are looking for depth. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, I know professors, okay, professors of like very prestigious subjects and in their teens, they were like begging girls to let them touch their breasts. I mean, how, how degrading is that? <laughs> Every once in a while, though, you see an ugly guy with a really good-looking girl. Sure, you have about money. <laughs> either that or dope. Ron Jeremy. A personality. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I really don't have a good personality. I have no idea what you were like back then. I don't know. I thought I was a great guy. Imagine all the energy I put into my radio show. I was putting into being a great guy. So you can imagine, I was a great guy back then. I was you didn't have a lot of guy friends either, though. No, nobody liked me that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she asked you, how much panasa did you make this year or this month or this, this week? I remember... My first experience with Jewish women. So I was going to uh, a, a Torah class at an Orthodox synagogue. And when I walked in, the rabbi says, I don't know you. I haven't screened you. You know, you can't come in. So I, I left the class and we went to this uh, kosher food stand. And it was operated by these, I think, Persian Persian women. And uh, the, the Persian big sister saw that we were both single and she said you need to let me see your tax returns and, and then uh, i might set you up and it's like wow i'd never met a non-jewish woman who'd asked to see my tax returns upon first meeting so i thought wow jews are really pragmatic this is this is interesting <laughs> Who wants guy? but yeah i mean this is this is how we date the first date we go to coffee and we show each other our tax returns our you know venereal health record and uh, you know bank account information just get it all out there so so it's on the table that there's no confusion it's uh look it may strike you as crass but i, I think it's much better to get down to talkless just just get down to brass tax i'm friends i never was interested but you in know like guys were happening they always had other guys hanging around them no nah, i didn't want to hang around happening guys i had enough problems if i hang around with happening guys <laughs> i'll never get anything. if you were happening you would have hung with a happening guy i had some happening guys you were too busy having a good personality to make any friends <laughs> right you kept i had to concentrate no i had a lot of cool guy friends believe me i could have i've met your friends bob layton i was friends with him who's that he's a cool guy you Who don't know him just Okay, Michael Savage here. He debates a Lubavitcher caller on the Rebbe and the Mashiach. Line three. Next up, what's on your mind? Station name, topic. Yes, Michael. The station is WABC. The topic is that we are not to lose hope by what happened in, in Paris in the outskirts. I am a Jewish American, theocentric religionist. My goal is to propagate uh, divine consciousness to everybody I can read. All right, fine. All right, so you're proselytizing on my show, but what's your main political point? My point is that anyone who noticed the town name of the printing shop where they were hold out would find a hint at something which is unbelievably uplifting and all the chaos and all the tragedy that was happening at that time. The first name of the town was Damartin, but the second name of the town was uh, Goel. Now, if someone who speaks Hebrew will know immediately that Goel means the Redeemer. So all that was happening is just to tell us that we're at the last throes of this uh, so this world uh, chaos, and it's going to come to a time of the redemption. That's what Goel means. And in fact, in 1992... Right, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got, okay, fine. Yeah, so we have redemption. How do you explain that President Obama didn't attend the rally? Is there any, any sign? Was there a sign somewhere in a toilet bowl that you saw? The reason that he didn't attend the rally... Was there a dripping icicle somewhere in, in, in Paris that gave you a symbol that there was a reason the President didn't attend that had to do with redemption? Absolutely. And the reason, uh, Let me hear about the icicle, the message in the icicle. Because we have a message in Proverbs which says that the hearts of kings are in the hands of God, that Obama doesn't do anything on his own, that he is like any of the other kings in the world. You mean so God wants America flooded with illegal aliens from Central America who don't work? No. To bankrupt our states? God wants our states bankrupted? No, God wants the people of the United States, and especially the Jewish people, to cry out and say, Ad Masai, when is this coming to an end? How long do we have to endure this? Oh, well, you, you may wait until eternity to have the liberal Jewish community say one word against Obama. Why do you think I'm publicizing that the Rebbe said the, the day that the professional left-wing Jewish organizations say one word against the president is the day of redemption. The day of redemption will come and we can't take it anymore. And we all cry out, we... But the liberal Jewish community is in lock, lockstep with him. I almost said lockstep, I'm sorry. But there's a segment of the Jewish... I almost said that they're in lockstep. Did you hear the joke or you don't have any sense of humor? What's the joke? I missed it. I said the liberal Jewish community is in lockstep with Obama. I'm not surprised, of course. Because... But I said lockstep, L-O-X. Did you get the joke? I got the joke. But you don't laugh, though. What's what's wrong with you? You don't laugh. Because I'm, I'm trying to say what I need to say. And you're I understand, but I can say what I need to say and laugh. Don't you have a sense of humor? Well, I, I never know if I'm going to counter the cantankerous Michael Savage. The uh, are, you, are you married with children? What? Of course. Are you ma you married? How many children do you have? And I know I have five. How many do you have? So you have five children. Don't they make you laugh every once in a while? Well, most of them are grown and out of the home already. Um, but uh, yeah, they do. Especially my grandchildren do. All right. So, so you have a, you have a sense of humor. I have a sense of humor, but I, all right. So okay, I said lockstep, and it wasn't funny. I get it. So what's the next thing on your revelation? My revelation on the revelation list. The point is that the Rebbe, Lubavitcher Rebbe, told us in 1992 that we have the Messiah now. All we have to do is to... Uh, please. He, he promised the Messiah in the year 1999. They kept waiting for it. He never came. 
No, nope, Messiah was there from the time of... Uh, oh, come on. I listened to it all during the 90s that the Mashiach is coming. He never came. He, the, the, it was like the, the Y2. He never came. To give you an instance of it. He was wrong. Instance of You're, it. Let's, don't, don't turn Rabbi Schneerson into a, into a god. He was a smart scientist who was also a good leader, but he was not uh, on the level of... See, what you're doing now is what radical Muslims do, is you're elevating your religious figures to a godhead. That's a mistake. Moses was not a godhead. He's just the Moses of a generation. Now, my but he, pr- he promised that the Messiah would come. Wasn't it in the year 1999? Nope. It was in 1991 that he said because of the Gulf War, it was a fulfillment of what happened, what it says in the... All right, we're going to go in circles now. It's like arguing on the head of a pin. Uh, look, he was just a man and a good man and a good leader, but he was not God, and he was certainly not the greatest prophet that the Jewish people have ever seen. So let me hear what else is in your prophetic vision, and I mean it sincerely. Of what he did as a Messiah. All right, let's forget him already. He's dead and buried. God bless him. Now, so what else is on your mind? There was a bloodless revolution in Russia, unheard of, in the annals of time. They overthrew communism. All right, so what's going to happen in my country is what I want to know with a leader like this, a spineless leader like Obama. Tell me how that, how that, how that works out. It's a fulfillment of the, the prophecy that, that there will be no leaders. There will be a thirst for leadership, that everybody will say, who can we follow? Where should we go? What should we do? And so we see that being fulfilled right in our own eyes. And this, All right, that I, that I agree with. We have no leadership. It's a vacuum. Okay. And then what happens? Then this will create a vacuum, like you said, to such a degree that everybody will know the only one who can get us out of this mess is God through his righteous Redeemer, who he is sending in the guise of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. All right, stop already, please. I, I, couldn't you just cut it off? That he was sending someone and they cut it off. You mean it has to be a Jewish leader now to save the world? Absolutely. Moses was a Jewish. Well, the Christians believe that there has to be a Christian leader. The Muslims would say it has to be a Muslim leader. So, don't you understand this is part of the division? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, every religion has their own view that only their religion and only their way is right. Everyone else is an idiot. That's why we have the event at Mount Sinai because Mount Sinai wasn't. In front right, of listen, my friend, I'm getting a migraine and only on the left side though. So, I'm going to have to say uh, sayonara or as we say in Hebrew, uh, whatever. Go, uh, whatever. I got a pain now ranging from my left ear to the top of my shoulder on the trapezius muscle. The, from the eye across the trape- trapezius muscles. And I'm going to take a break and see if I can massage it away. I'll be right back. Okay, Michael Savage. From uh, Mr. Savage to Dr. Savage to uh, Joe, Joe Biden here. Disparities. And I'm going to say something's going to get me in trouble, which you couldn't go through a whole show without doing that. And that is that, think about it. If you want to know where the American public is, look at the money being spent in advertising. Did you ever five years ago think every second or third ad out of five or six you'd turn on would be biracial couples? Brookish no, out. no, I'm not, I'm not being facetious. The reason I'm so hopeful is this new generation. They're not like us. They're thinking differently. They're more open. And we got to take advantage of it. I want you to... Brookish I'm out. sorry. Brookish I want you to meet uh, Louver. Brokashem, Brokashem. Okay, this is uh, Howard's wife's last time on the air. Howard Stern's wife, Allison, just before they got divorced. This is December 18, 1998. I'm the phantom of the calling. Hold your nose, hold your nose, hold your nose. So they'd uh, probably been separated for months before this, but they are pretending on the air here that they still live together. I was listening to Black Music last night. Lauren Hill's album. Have you heard the whole album? No. Very good. The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Yo, 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 pow! I like to listen to black people's music. Because it keeps me in touch with black people, and I don't have to live in the same community where I get beat up. You don't actually have to go in direct right. with it. Yeah, it keeps me, it keeps me uh, in touch. You think? It's enough in touch for me. I've been in touch enough. Between videos and music. Yeah. I, wa- I rent some of them gangster films. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was exciting, Robin. That was really oh. great. Let's take some phone calls and see what everyone's up to today. By the way, uh, only the show is only beginning because um, more farting hijinks uh, today. Someone is going to come in here and fart silent night. That's going to be happening later on. Paul Turner, our announcer, will be playing the gossip game. It's always funny to hear his deep voice. Jeez. Jeez. How are you? Hey, who's this? Who's this, Steve Kingston? Steve. Steve who? This is Steve. Oh, hey, Steve. How you doing, Howard? Mm. Hey, I just happened to uh, be... Uh, Something about some other radio station. What's the matter with you? Okay. Stupid ass. How ridiculous. Uh, how ridiculous. <laughs> the guy was going to call in and say that my wife was hitting it on... Uh, one of the DJs from Z100 last night. Was what? Hitting on one of the oh. DJs from Z100. My, my wife went to that jingle ball. Yeah, that big that's... Christmas concert. Yeah, I really pissed. I didn't say a word to her about it, man, but she it really pissed me off. You're upset no, about has Did no you clue. Get back to her? No. Z100 is a competing radio station here in New York, and uh, they have this thing, Jingle Ball. 
I, my, you know, I don't know what the jingle ball is. They're not even old bands she's into, right? She's, she tries to act like she's into these bands. I never once have heard her listen to music, all right, <laughs> between you and me. Oh, no. So, uh, so <laughs> she's running around the house. i got to get tickets to the jingle ball. Jingle ball. Now, I know what the jingle ball is. Z1, it's, it's a Z, yeah, they have it every it's a Z100 promotion. Show, yeah. And they're not even having good bands there this year. They're, like Mariah Carey. Not Mariah Carey. Uh, Shania Twain. Shania Twain. You know, that was the biggest name they had. There. The other ones I've never even heard of. Well, the uh, Goo Goo Dolls were there. Well, okay, Goo Goo Dolls. So I was like, i got to get tickets to the uh, jingle balls. And I'm going, you know, does she know how I make my living? That I'm on the radio? That it might be potentially embarrassing to me to have, have my a wife? wife at the jingle this, balls. Yeah. sounds like a girlfriend's house. Can you yeah, it well, matter. yeah, it doesn't it's matter. matter. No, I know it's it's just a, like, you want to know something, man? I gave him my shrink set to me. Get you tickets my shrink set to me, you know, uh, you know you, you, what's the big deal? It could be funny. I go, no, no. He's not into competition either. He sits in an office. Right. I said, you don't understand something. For years, thank you. I wish you were my shrink. <laughs> I get nowhere. <laughs> I, I, uh, I do wish she was my wife. You. I'd marry her in a minute. <laughs> she, if, you, if she would look at me sexually. <laughs> what do I need to marry for than have her ignore me? <laughs> I got that already. <laughs> yeah. Oh, your penis is so small. Would have married you years ago if I didn't think you ridiculed me. Uh, all right. Oh. So, anyway. All right. Oh, shut up. I'm cutting you right in half right now. So, listen to this. So like, she's running around the house looking for Jingle Ball tickets. And she's my, my sister, Laura, Jingle Ball, Jingle Ball. And I'm sitting in my office, I'm like, Jingle Ball? Jingle Ball my ass. I'm like, she's freaking out. You know, I mean, but in a real way, I'm just getting, because, like, you know what? I compete with radio stations for a living. Mm -hmm. That's how she gets to drive around in fancy cars. If you didn't do, J Jingle Ball would like to see you dead. Right. <laughs> Everyone at that Jingle Ball wishes I was dead because I'm the number one goddamn disc jockey in the Jingle world. Jingle Ball would like to kill you. Yeah. And I'm just saying to myself, boy, this is awfully passive aggressive. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. Oh, you no know. You know a lot. What she's thinking about. What do you think she's thinking about? I'm hoping she's not thinking. Well, do you think that people don't think? I, I think they do. I don't know. I, you know, I hate to say it, but I think even, you know, when you say you're not thinking, you're thinking. it's just you're thinking. Right. And I, you know what? I used <laughs> you to. You don't want to know how horrible a person you are. I know I'm never thinking, but I'm thinking. <laughs> What is a Baba Boo? You know, I can tell you something that a rumor that I heard this is going to make you nuts. Go ahead. You know, um, so we put in a ticket request. Right. Which is all because right. radio station get tickets for all events. Yeah. It's a big concert and stuff. I think that we couldn't get tickets. You know, you might have this request for tickets. And right. Nobody here wants to disappoint. Right. So I think that um, they bought the tickets from scalpers. Oh, my God. I'm so embarrassed. Like First of all, you know what else? You know what else? I don't want my wife asking the station for anything. I don't ask the station for anything. It's such a, it's such a goddamn insult to me that my kids and my wife are over at the Z100. What about my kids? They don't know what I do for a living. My wife doesn't tell them. Well, but no, I push no, my ball. No, that's, you encourage them to listen to Z100. Yeah, that's fine. I don't care if they listen to the race. I'm going to be some hard ass. But my wife, I'm, saying, I'm, not saying, go, I I'm saying my wife, I mean, she, why? I work my ass off to beat the pants off all these guys. Why would she do that to that me? That would be like General Lee's wife, you know, right. to a, a union ball. Yeah, and getting upset about slavery <laughs> or something, you know? You know what it is? It gives, I understand where you come from. But I mean, did General Lee's wife say, did General, Lee's wife, General Lee was from the South, right? Did his wife go, you know, honey, maybe we should free the blacks? No. No. And he doesn't, you know, I'm going to that ball to raise money to, to free the blacks. Right. <laughs> so you know, you know what it does? Seriously. You know and it gives them fodder for on the air. Yeah, how many people can survive using their marriage as, as fodder for their writing or for their show? Like, what are some famous examples of, of couples who survived this this level of disclosure? Right. And all that. Right. Now, now, and even off the air, right. they can tell you, you know, Howard's going to be number one only once. Hey, he's going to get tickets. Right. His yeah. wife right. and his kids want to be over here. And it really pisses me off, but I didn't say nothing. I don't say anything anymore. I used to, say, I used to mouth off about everything, but now I just sit and I still. Is that good for you? Nah, nothing's good for me. Yeah, I'll you? tell you what's good for me. You don't want to hear what's good for me. But you said you brought this up to the shrink. I'll tell you what's good for me. You brought this up to the shrink, you said. I did bring it up. What did you say? Did he say? I don't want to discuss it. Did he, didn't he say that you should, um, I mean, Robert's right. Did you think it's really good for you to just sit and let it fester? No, he said, in fact, he said, nah, I don't want to get into it. What? Now, he was, uh, well, it's all about, you know, he thinks that I'm, think he thinks I'm a madman, okay? Does he think you're wrong? Well, you know what? what? Guess what? Only madmen get anywhere. Right. Where the hell is he? Right. <laughs> you think you're making too big a deal out of it? Is that the point? I don't know. And then I heard that, like, Steve Kingston had to go to Z100 personally and pick up the tickets. Yeah, now you got to be making calls. Yeah, now I owe Steve Kingston. I don't want to owe people. My wife doesn't get it. I don't want to owe anybody. Where, where is my wife? John, 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 get her on the phone. Get her on the phone. Are you finally ready to talk about it? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Howard, when, when, when I'm going to ask her, do you know what I do for a living? <laughs> Howard, can I ask you a question? Yeah. When, you, when she gets on the phone right now, yeah. will she have any inkling at all that you're feeling this way? I don't know. Don't ask me. Will this be a huge surprise her that you're a little angry about You know, this? but what you're going to hear is, oh, what's the big deal? Yeah. Because it isn't a big deal to anybody she doesn't, Yeah, she doesn't go into work every day and bust her balls. You know, She's just spending my money. Howard. I mean, no offense. Well, I mean, I'm not a, uh, how spending the money part is not important to me. My wife's probably on IMUS this morning. Oh, no. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it just kind of irked me a little bit because I do work so friggin' hard. But why would and you, they reap all the benefits. But why wouldn't you just say something? Because uh, I used to say something, then it gets into a big argument. Well, I don't know how you say it either. Oh, I'll tell you I how I say it. I say, you're not going to that goddamn thing. Why don't you think about who I am? No, See, I know how you feel about this because yeah. we talk about this. Right. Okay? Right. I don't know that anybody knows how no. deeply you feel about uh, you this outside of here. This woman traveled the country with me for 20 years. I don't It's not She knows exactly how I feel. It's not the same as knowing. Bottom line, what it means. But, but why does it always have? Why do you have to bring it up like that? Could you say it in a? No, I don't say. I don't. I don't I, I mean, I'm frankly, sorry. If you, just, you really knew how Howard felt, would you ever bring it up?
Stop it now. No, seriously. No, don't talk to me like that. I'm not allowed to. All right. But, but really. What is it you need to say to me? Okay. Don't you think it might bother Did it ever occur to you that it might bother me that I work every day and Z100 spends all day trying to beat me and that I'm in competition with another radio station that it might be potentially embarrassing me to me that my children, my wife? Well, I don't think anybody knew that I was going did you know that Steve Kingston had to go buy tickets for you from a scalper? Yeah. And, then yeah. I now, and now that I, I'm the one who has to pay for that? I mean, no. I don't even money. I mean, no, I was, I was willing to pay for any tickets I got. I was starving. No, but they feel, listen, when you call, they don't want to disappoint no, you. No, they said to me, we don't think we can do it. And I said, fine. But I they, wasn't looking for anything. I'm not, I mean, listen, if he had to buy tickets, then, then I would certainly pay for the tickets. I wasn't looking for anything at all. But I mean, you know, the, I mean, were interested in going, and that was it. How, who was there that was so important? Shania Twain? I mean, I'm just scared. I'm not, I mean, I don't know. Oh, I guess it bothers me. Why don't we talk about a problem? No, but I mean, it just bothers me. It bothers me. Really not, I'm what? If you want, you want. I'll talk to Steve and I'll pay him the money. No, no, no. You don't really pay. No, that's not. Don't pay him. I'm not interested in this. Oh, I'm really not. All right. I'm really sorry. I'll well, talk to you when I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> just like I yelled at you. Ah, how about those meds? Uh, so not a good idea. <laughs> it was not a good idea. <laughs> but, but I think it was a big controversial discussion. I just no, don't no, think... But you know no, what, once it's again, way... it got mired in, just in the wrong area. Mm. It had nothing to do with the money. Plus, if she pays Steve, she's paying him with my money. So I don't want her to pay Steve. It has nothing to do with the money. Oh. The truth is, you don't appreciate it. It seems like a lack of support. And, and it's like the president of General Motors, his wife driving a Mercedes. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Oh, you might have been a little teeny tiny bit condescending. Maybe was I? Maybe right. the, oh, maybe the angle took over. No, the truth is Well, the truth is, but sometimes it's how you say they start talking about issues other than the real issue. Well, I didn't have any real issue. Yeah, your real issue is that you don't want her going to other radio station events. But she knows that. No, she doesn't. She doesn't? Because right, she thinks it's about the money. Oh, no, it's not about the money. But that's what she thought. See, because you all right, you know, you started piling into another area that really has nothing to do with the real got area of concern. Yes. Oh. Tell me the truth. Right. I gotta know. How, yeah. how do you walk in the door? What are you talking about? What's the, what, that's, such a, I mean, that's such a controversial discussion whether my wife should go to the jingle. No, no, I'm saying that she seems very irritated. Well, she, maybe she's irritated, but maybe about something else. I, I mean, that, that's not a, <laughs> was that really a big deal? Oh, 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 oh my God. The jingle ball? Oh, dear. Well, if it wasn't a big, a big deal, why are you talking about it? Well, I'm just saying it irks me on a scale of 1 to 10. It might be a 3 as opposed to a 10. Well, why did you tell her that at the very beginning? Well, I was trying to work into it, but she hung up on me. <laughs> That's a 3. I don't want to be around for a well, 10. Well, maybe it's a 10. <laughs> wow. No, I just, I feel very... No, I understand. I feel attacked. I, I understand he feels anything. unsupported. I understand. Right. It is weird because she's been with you since the beginning and she knows the whole radio thing. Right, like the right. New right. Wife right. But I don't know that everybody understands it the way we, well, me and Howard understand. I don't even think you understand but it. Jackie, would, Jackie would go to the Jingle Ball. He would do the same thing. I guess hey, it's a good time. Ticket. <laughs> I mean, Jackie would go to the Jingle Ball. Yeah, he would have the same deal going. Right. And we have the same problem with him. We feel unsupported by him. Mm. Switch wives? I guess you <laughs> Oh. I would switch wives. My wife doesn't want to be with you. <laughs> No, 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 we didn't take it for the jingle ball. No, no, no. hi, Tim. No yeah, yo, Howard, man. Yo, man. It's crazy to you. You should not even get into that situation. But if that was my wife, I would have knocked out. Oh, great. You would have beaten your wife for that. No, not beat her. I'll beat her up. But I would have just knocked out with the tickets. Right. <laughs> ah, I got big hands. Really, What do you say? I always got big hands. Oh, ha, ha, ha. It's right everybody's mind. Right. Yes, Lisa, what is it? Howard, listen. Yeah. You have nothing to prove because you are number one and everyone knows that. So right. the fact that Allison can go and show her face and represent shows these people. Look, Howard is not the least bit threatened by you people. So you, don't you know, know, you got nothing on him. So that just shows you should just support her. She can go anywhere she wants. I'm number one in the country. And that's the end of it. I don't see it that way. And you don't understand, Howard. Point. Howard, oh, no matter what Howard has, he always has something to prove. I don't think there's ever anything. Right. That's not the point. Yeah, we have a bunker mentality nothing. here. Let's get serious. Yeah, we do have a bunker mentality. You know what? I've seen you work with other like radio guys that we've competed against. I've seen guys down and out, but just not quite dead. Right. And I said, you know, I, I mean, he's almost dead. And you're like, no, he has to die. Right. Well, that's how I feel about it. We have that mentality. Because it's just like, if I, ever, if I ever had to shoot somebody, like if I was Bernie Getz and I had to shoot someone on the subway, I would shoot them until they were dead. Right. The, guy would, yeah, the guy would not get up again. I mean, to well, me. That's exactly right. You you don't go trying to nick the guy. Right. You shoot him <laughs> you dead. Kill him. In fact, you know what? And I don't want, I don't want. We're not really nicking bad. these radio people. Mm -hmm. You know what right. you said to me once, Howard? Oh, yeah. I forget. Remember, you know. We used, to, you know, we used to deal with Imus, right. and then we went to the mornings, and we crushed him. To right. the point where the Spanish radio station was at one point beating him in the morning. Right, right. And you were still pummeling away at him. And I said, you know, Howard, don't you think, like, what are we even talking about? Don't you think enough is enough? Right. And then somehow he resurrected himself, and you said, see, Gary, we should have killed that's him. Right, that's right. That's right. can always come back. I would have killed him. <laughs> and that's the way we live. We've always lived this way. Sean, yes, you're uh, on the air. Yeah, Howard, uh, I completely agree with you. Your wife should be a little bit uh, more understanding of those type of things. Of course. Of course, everyone should be understanding of me. <laughs> no, it's not that everyone should be understanding of you. <laughs> it's simply that this is what we do for a living. It's right. the most important thing. But I, I also agree with you. You uh, you had you had what you uh was, was upsetting you on your mind, and then you kind of you, got you, sidetracked when you were trying to explain it to her. Because you know why? I'll tell you exactly why. If you really want to know. All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what you should do, Howard? Right. You should no, call wait. her back and re-explain yourself. No, I would like to. Because it's no, very. No, you know what the no. truth is? Well, I wouldn't do that. You're terrible. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. The truth is, <laughs> you, you do. talk about all those other things mm -hmm. because this one really hurts, and not to be understood in this area is really painful and upsetting and scary. Yeah, you should be married. <laughs> oh, you're much better than that. Howard. Yeah. Uh, one quick question. I gotta take off. I'm from Boston, and uh, I remember when you came on the air down here. Right. <clears throat> And, um, By the way, uh, BCN is a great radio station. It's WBCN in Boston yeah. that we're on, and it's a thrill for me to be on that radio station.
No, I don't know him. Okay, because you mentioned his name on your opening press conference, but I was just wondered there was rumors he had. You did listen to him, to him over moment, there. right? Sorry, what, Rob? Didn't you get to listen to him while you were in Boston? Yeah, I, I heard him when I was in Boston. I was a big morning radio guy in, in Boston. I used to get to sleep in because I didn't have classes till late. But I heard Charles a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, no, he was a decent guy. I thought maybe you guys knew each other. You were aware of him. I was aware of him. Thank oh, you. Have a good holiday. All right, later. Bye. All right, so anyway, uh, I don't know. That was a pretty big session. I didn't mean to go that way. What if Allison had to come to you the way that last girl caller came to you? Like, Howard, you're number one, you're the best, like, they can't touch you, you shouldn't be nah. threatened. I'm not saying that. Yeah, I, I, I'm you. not saying I agree with one way or the other. Again, you don't understand. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You don't understand. No, no, I totally understand, understand where he's coming it. from, but I'm saying would that have made it any no. different? Jim, what is it? <laughs> Now, I just want to tell you, call your wife, man, because you know you're going to have to put up with this when you go home. You might as well just do it on the air, get it over with. You don't want to hear it. Yeah, just be quiet. No, I don't have to go home. I can stay this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. How long? Two weeks? I don't know. Two, three weeks? What do you mean, how long? What do I care? What am I, baby? I got to, I mean, you know. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what did I say that was so terrible? You did. That's what I just said, hey, well, how was the... You know what? I don't know why everybody's so sensitive. <laughs> Everyone is sensitive. I got 50 bucks that you can't even get her back on the phone. Oh, I'm sure I can. I, I think you can. I think you're right. <laughs> but I, I better have a good vacation, I'll tell you that. Because if I don't... Wait a minute. That's a good... How are you going to have a good vacation? I don't want to hear anything about it. This is ridiculous. I just wanted to say, I don't think, I don't think anybody should be going to Jingle Ball who works here. I don't think anybody's family should be going to the Jingle Ball. That's how I feel about it. That's absolutely, and everybody knows that. I think we're at war. Those people are trying to take my money out of my out of you my hands. You have the same mentality as a boxer, right? Sitting in the ring, looking at the guy across the that's ring. That's how I see it. That guy's trying to take food out of my children's mouth. Right. I, that's how I pay for my kids' clothes. Those guys want to see me. Those guys go to the ad agencies every day and tell them lies that's about right. me. That's right. So what, what? What am I supposed to do? Go support Those their are event? The same people who send in complaints uh, anonymously to the FCC. Yeah, that's how I see it. Mind. That's how I see it. They're my enemy. That's the guy. And I don't fraternize with the enemy. That, but, but you don't see. The, uh, seriously, you think it would be right if your wife went to the jingle ball? No, I know. I agree with you. Johnny, ask me outside. I totally agree with you. Especially for you. I want people on the show, especially for you. I'm a high-profile guy. Well, no, it's, you're the guy. Yeah. That's your wife. I mean, people look at what she does. Yeah. I'm talking about it forever. But now it's... Right. Somebody wouldn't even recognize my wife, but your wife is, you know... She's yeah, it's my wife. Let me tell you something. We're not even allowed to wear competing uh, station t-shirts at this station. That's right. The station certainly takes it seriously. That's right. Uh, everybody. What is it, Benji? Oh, Alan. Okay. Throw water under the bridge, boss. Just call him from the lawyer. Honey, I don't. <laughs> honey, I don't want to fight. Howard, let me explain to you what right. I was trying. Please. Of all, you knew about this. If you had I know. a problem when I asked you. No, I never would say anything. No, no, but you're entitled to say something if you had a problem. No, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm doing a shtick. That's all. No, but you were very condescending. Gary, hit right you're right. Head. You're right. I apologize. And that's what I objected to. I'm perfectly willing to have a conversation, and I would never do anything to jeopardize your job or your standing or go to a competition. I mean, I would never do anything like that. I know. I know. It was maybe a misunderstanding. I should have said something. And I will, and I will use my money to pay these no, things. I felt funny uh, saying anything to you. I figured if, uh, you know, if you felt uh, sort of angry at the other radio stations and <laughs> wanted to join in on that, I felt that uh, perhaps uh, you would come to it yourself. But if not, that's okay. I mean, you know, listen. No, no, that's not fair. Honey, I'll do my best to beat those guys anyway, even though you're a fan and theirs. <laughs> and I'll do my best so I can support you and the kids. I, and... I took a look at those DJs. I'm never listening to that station again. Well, listen, uh, you know, listen. What the heck? Uh, listen, oh, you gave them a couple bucks and uh, you help them out. And... That's all right with me. I don't care. What the hell? You know what I'm saying? No, listen, Let's just have a nice time and if relax. If you had a problem, and I, it's not like I did it behind your back. I went to you. I checked with you. No, you seem very excited about it. I was so the uh, porn stars that I knew said they, they got to play with uh, Howard's penis when he was still married. They'd show up at the radio station and go to town on him. Go, yeah, I oh, like, this is the story. You told me you weren't checked with it at all. No, I wasn't. Yes. It was actually the tickets were gotten without my so knowledge. I said to him, Laura told me days later that so she got I, the tickets. Excuse me. I was in your office, and I said to you, how the kids want to go to Jingle Balls. Is there any way you could get me tickets? Can I check with the station? You go, I don't think I can get you, but yeah, you can check into it. Period. So I said, all right, oh. then I stand corrected. I, I, I must I be wrong. Never, I would never do anything behind your back. I know, I know. All right, let's, no, no offense taken. Let's, please, let's not bring it up anymore. <laughs> it's not coming home with us. That's what I wanted to say. Right, that's what I say. Now I feel good about coming home. The air is clear, and I can walk in the house and enjoy my day. And right? they would make it on a Friday night next year. Oh, let's hope so. And, I, and honey, you'll be sure that I'll buy the whole hall for you because I'm going to work my hardest to support you and the kids. Even with this, even though even though my family supports the other radio station, I'm going to do my best to win. I feel like we're in a Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> I said this is Ozzy and Harriet. I'm biting my tongue so badly. Uh, are you bloody? I, I, there's blood dripping out of my mouth. <laughs> no, this is the way you got to be married. Though. Oh, oh Lord. Stop Sometimes it. you got to hear the other person and what they're saying. Oh, my psychiatrist you're says, you got to hear. Now you're being passive. No, I'm not. I have to. You are not communicating. Can I tell you something, Robin? Like a pee Let me tell you what I'm doing right now. You don't have to be angry. I have a two week. I have a two-week vacation where I gotta live at home. You understand? You're gonna go back to your empty apartment. I honestly want to know your feelings. No, she doesn't. Absolutely, no. I do. Are right, you want to know my feelings? Yeah. No, I don't think this is. They're, they're gonna egg us on into an argument. No, 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 no. no, no. You want to argue? I don't right. want you to right. argue. All right. All right. Want to know my feelings? Here are my feelings. Feel Here are my feelings. <laughs> Allison, yes. you have been with me the whole way, right? Right. All right. You know what angst I go through, even but when I, even when somebody edits one word of mine. All you know what? to do is say any of this to me. No, I know. I know. I know. But. But you know how I no, felt. You, see, that's not fair to do it you have never, you know, listen, you. I'm not a mind reader. No, that's true. I feel I did uh, not support this. I don't think I was. Originally
And that was the time to say, you know what, I have a problem with no. you going. No, I wouldn't say it because I don't want to be controlling. You have to do your thing, I'll do mine. But now you're being extremely controlling. Not at all. I, in fact, uh, d just decided to uh, let you do your thing, not to try to uh, interfere. Well, wait a minute, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. I felt that you already were in the midst of getting tickets. I wasn't being asked permission. It was a question of you were no, hunting I, tickets. I ran the whole thing by you in terms of... After, after you already started hunting. The hunt was already on for the tickets. No, That's, it wasn't. Uh, I, see, but, but I don't even want to go over this history. Uh, you're right. I am telling you... But now you're trying to have it both ways. No. You, know, you, you say you held your tongue at the time right. and decided that you were going to let it be okay and let everything go through, and now right. you're changing your mind thing. and saying right. it really bothered you. All right, let's put it this way, then. Here's how I feel. If you're in a war, and my wife knows I'm in a war. She knows I compete with Z100. I don't have to spell it out for her. She knows it. If you're in a war, mm -hmm. all right, and your wife has been there all well, along, and see what if I go through. you were in a war, mm -hmm. you would have stopped somebody from fraternizing with the enemy. Now, there's extenuating circumstances. Oh, here we go. My wife feels I'm too controlling. She feels that I'm a boss. There's a whole other array I... of things to do in the world so besides the jingle ball. Not in my house, there wasn't. It was the most important now thing on the list. No. It was a whole big event and, and, and extra tickets for friends and uh, all kinds maybe, of things. you know, things have gotten a little comfortable and you've been number one for a long time. I've forgotten that there's a do war you think, going on. Do you think I want to owe Steve Kingston for running around Absolutely looking for not. tickets? Absolutely I've expressed not. that a million times. I know. Do you think I want you to owe Steve Kingston? How many times? Answer me this fairly. Okay. Do, don't I, haven't I always said that I hate asking the station for Howard, any kind of... that's why I checked with you about everything. But I didn't, want to be, I didn't want to be controlling. But you have a right to be honest. No, I couldn't be in this case. Well, oh, then that's so not fair. Then that's not fair. Don't say anything now. You felt I expect to people honest. to understand that they should not call... I'm sorry. Well, I don't think it's that big a leap. There's the point. I don't think it's that big a leap to know that, that the Z100 is my arch enemy. I understand you because I do this every day. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Howard here. You, you don't want you, your wife supporting the enemy, and you don't want to have to tell her that this is not okay. So, yeah, my empathy is with Howard here. I don't know. My wife lives with me. You don't think she knows me that well, that I sit down there and scream bloody murder about everything? I think what Howard is saying that it shouldn't have even been an issue. Right. I didn't want to be the one to bring it up. I've been down this road. You've told me many times on other issues that you think I should just know. Right. I'm not sure, you know, but I have said that. There's some things you know. But if she did mention it to you, there was your opportunity. All right. So, fine. I am at fault. I am at fault. No, 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 no. No, no, I'm accepting blame. But she didn't ask for permission. This is New York City. This is where I This is where I work. This is right in my face. My children. No, I'm saying right. No, I think Howard said she didn't say I accept that I handled it wrong. Yes. I just thought you would understand. Intuitively. And what? Did you silence? Let me ask you something. If your husband works at radio stations all these years, and you know I compete, and I've never once set foot in another radio station event, and you've never set foot at other radio station events. Well, maybe I went as a spy. No, I know when you're going as a spy. You weren't going as a spy. And I'm just saying, it, it seems to me there are certain inherent things you know. It's almost like... Uh, Howard, that's why I brought it up. Right. And discussed it with you. Well, okay. That's she was then I'm wrong. The rules changed. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I didn't think there was much room for discussion. Well, there was plenty of room for discussion. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought so, but okay. Well, right, so have we worked it I'm out? I'm sorry I gave you that impression because that's where I was coming from. And I'm sorry too. <laughs> no, you I'm, are bad. What do you mean? No, I'm sorry. You are bad. I'm, no, I'm sorry You're for sorry. what I did. I'm sorry I didn't speak up. in private parts. What happened? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> You're getting rusty. No, listen. Let me tell you something. Oh, he's very withholding, and then this is what he does. Well, I hear that. Yes. Right. Listen to me. <laughs> Gary, let me ask you something. Yes. Would you go to the Jingle Ball? Personally, me, absolutely. How do you know not to go? Why would well, you say uh, you wouldn't go to the Jingle Ball? Because I'm a recognizable character from the show, right. and I think it would make you unhappy. Do you think some people recognize? Why, honey, have you ever been recognized as my wife in, in public? Not last night. Not last night, but in, in, in your history. But excuse me, I don't even like Gary's reasoning. I wouldn't go because I would never support a Z100 event. Right, but, I, right. but I also would make what you unhappy. What did he say? Not at all. What he said he? he wouldn't go because he's recognizable oh. and blah blah blah. No, blah. Uh, shut I up a second. The blah 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 is it would make Howard unhappy. So I don't support Z100. Period. It has nothing to do with Howard. I don't either. I but I was K Rock. I got you, Robin. He wouldn't support Z100 because I wouldn't allow it. Right. For whatever reason, it would make you unhappy. Why wouldn't it make you unhappy? It would, but but why do you feel this is how you make a living? You know how I put. You know how I put food on my table? I was most important to me. You know how my kids have a stereo and a printer and a this and a that? You know how they get it? By me kicking the crap out of, out of these other radio stations. You know what these other radio stations spend their time doing all day? They badmouth me. They go to ad agencies. They talk about dirty words that I use, how they shouldn't spend their dollars. You don't think Do you, you should know that? that? You don't think my wife knows it? You don't think Robin knows I, that? I, I don't right. And if you have a problem, we should have had that conversation. I don't have a problem. It's, it's something really you've got to feel. You're not honest. I wasn't honest. I should have pointed it out. You're right. All right. We should have had that conversation. Yeah, I said to you, how do you... Let me say something to Gary Allison, seriously. Because, all right. You know what my wife's saying? That I should have had a discussion with her? Right. You should just know that inherently. And, and I do. All right. My wife doesn't know that inherently. You should know that inherently. But, 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 and Jackie should know that but, inherently. Up a point. And Fred should know it inherently. But, listen, I, I do know it inherently, and I checked with you to see if you had a problem right. about it. No, I would you never know? say it. Same with Gary. When Gary comes to me, I tell him, Gary, stop asking permission. you got to know what to do. Well, Howard, then that's not well, fair to people are fine. <laughs> right. But I'm saying that I'm gonna, but I was wrong. I should have said something. You're absolutely right. You should have. Yes, you I should have. I should have said something. No, here's the answer. Can I say something? Here's the answer. Allison, I think Allison maybe... should have known not to bring it up, but when she did, you should have said something. Right. All right, fine. There you go. All right. Well, there are lots of times that I see concerts I might like to go to, and then I see another radio station sponsoring them. It goes right out the window. Right. I'm not going. Right, of course. Of course. But of course, Robin. But of course. But I'm just telling you how that's what you do for a living. Well, Robin knows. Robin, Robin sees me every day getting beaten and defeated and, and I'm down.
We, I, I, I don't need to tell Robin, but I'm telling you, go. John. Yeah, we don't have to go. Jackie and Fred. Fred knows. Yeah, Fred knows. He didn't leave the house. Right. <laughs> Hold it, Allison. Um, there's a guy in line who wants to invite you to something. Hold on. <laughs> what is it, Kevin? Hi, Allison. How are you doing? Very good. I just wanted to, just wanted to let you know that uh, the Mark and Brian Christmas party in Los Angeles is coming up, and you're more than welcome. Well, honey, there's a Mark and Brian Christmas show. What do you think about going to that? Who's ah. playing there? Who's playing there, sir? <laughs> Who am I going to have? Well, Shania Twain's going to be there, too. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I'll check with my kids. See so if the kids want to go. The whole family can support the Mark and Brian show. Well, on the other hand, I have See, a representative from Man Cow, too. Yeah, please. Uh, tell, tell, tell him to... Uh, I could be a spy. Right. I could be these other events. That's true. You go to all the balls. All right. All right, honey, I hope that this clears the air. Uh, I apologize for not discussing my hatred of other radio stations. Uh, that was my fault, okay? Okay, and, and I uh, apologize for even, that's right. even uh, bringing it up in some way. But no, you, you don't have anything to apologize for. <laughs> at all. So, at all. I have a question for Robin. You want to get laid this week. <laughs> well, I, I want to be able to live. That's all. I, I, got a, I got two weeks off. I want to just relax and watch my movies and mellow out and be pleasant. Should, that should not really be the reason. It should be that you want to work this out. Yes, I do want to work it out. That's, why I, that's what I want. Okay. I want everybody to leave me alone is what I really want. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question but, for Robin. Yes, yes, go ahead. When I go to the KRR Christmas party this, this next week. Go ahead. That we share with uh, w WFAN. Oh, I would go there. I talk to anybody? Then let your question. Why do you talk to Gilman? Why do you talk to Gilman at the wedding? Why talk to him? He's on the same TV Yeah, at the same time we're on the radio. Why'd you talk to him? Oh, don't Why? Because that's, that's not even our audience. That's not our audience. Come on. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. If you put it that way, you can't talk to the whole world. That's right. It's different going directly. To somebody else. But you so wouldn't go to the party? Would... You think I should just walk in? Did, did, did I get down on my knees in front of the government? I said, hello. The Christmas party you you should be for <laughs> K Rock, where we work in New York. You're probably right. It should not be between K Rock and WFA. I don't know if they badmouth me. I wouldn't go set foot with those people, and I wouldn't let my kids either. Because they're trying to take money out of my mouth. I'm here busting my ass. What's so hard to understand? <laughs> so, Robin, that's the reason you're not I apologize. Yes, I Ten years reasons. Oh, that was because I didn't want to go. But this I wouldn't set foot in there. I wouldn't set foot with them. I was not working on that day, and so I said, you know, maybe it'd be nice to go to the K-Rock Christmas party. Then I keep saying, I, I, I was going to go to the K-Rock Christmas party for the first time this year. I'll tell you why I was going to go. What? Because uh, some people said to me, gee, you never show up. It'd be very nice. It's a nice thing if you just stopped in even for like a drink or something. Mm -hmm. Not working. And uh, we're not working, and, right. and, and I've got to be in the city I was anyway. Considering it, yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I said to myself, wait a second. I'm going to sit there with those skunks and low lives over another radio station. And we work with Imus. It was really Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The day I sit down and break bread with Imus, the day I should get my fat ass off the radio. That's what I say. You won't see me fraternizing with anybody. I am, I am, I am an animal when it comes to this stuff because they're animals to me. And if you don't think they're sending letters, to, let me tell you something. And Allison, I want you to hear this. Z100, uh, honey, please, I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> Z100 sends letters every day to the FCC under false names. I have that. I have that for a fact. Documented. Documented. You think I go to their goddamn jingle ball? I'll cut their goddamn jingle balls off. Oh, my wife wouldn't have known that. <laughs> you understand? Uh, she doesn't really know that. that. She doesn't see that side of me. Well, right? you know, maybe this means you should share a little more with me. Well, maybe. You want to yell like that at home? <laughs> you got to believe me. Believe me. She's worried out because, you know, Mel throws the party for the K-Rock party. I don't care who throws the, the party. She owns both the stations. Yeah, yeah. I know. Let's go with the kids to the K-Rock party. Go. Go fraternize with everybody. <laughs> right, let everyone, let everybody do whatever they want. All right. I'm a defeated man. <sighs> now there's an attitude. You're a tortured man. <laughs> Tortured man, yeah. <laughs> what am I doing? Where am I? I just, I just, I just lost consciousness. Take a giant breath. Oh. I apologize. I apologize. I sorry, my audience, my wife. I just lost consciousness. Okay, that was pretty good. Uh, let's uh, check in. What, what the heck is going on with uh, Owen Benjamin here? It is. If you think I'm liberal now, they think I'm liberal now because I don't like piranhas' action. Well, if you think I'm liberal, you thought wrong. One of the worst people in the universe understands me. And you got Tim Heidecker, who understands me. You got Vic Berger, who understands me. And it just goes on and on. All the top iconic people in history, whether you know they're on top or on the bottom, they all have one thing in common. Mike's nice. Remember this? Here's the newest one. Owen Benjamin loves Red Bar. And we have the, is this the clip, the YouTube version? Yeah, that's. Or are they both the same? They're both the same. Okay, but that's so like we're going to go to 352. Version. Let's go to 352. I was just wondering where Owen Benjamin was. You know who hates Owen Benjamin, and he's wrong. Mersh. Mersh went after Owen Benjamin, collected Owen Benjamin's craziest fans, the Bears. Okay, there's a, a question in the chat. Do, do I have any advice on how, becoming more like Howard Stern, low in empathy and just severe and brutal like Howard Stern and uh, Governor Cuomo and uh, Red Bar? And uh, no, I, I think for very few people with this kind of attitude work, and this is a performance, right? What Howard Stern is giving there is a performance when he knows that his marriage is already busting up. So very few people are served by taking Howard Stern's attitude into real life. 
very few people are served by taking Red Bar's attitude into real life. So they're putting out a performance, just like you watch the National Football League, and it's, you could uh, say to me, Luke, I saw that uh, safety for who won the Super Bowl this year. Oh, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, man. He really laid out that uh, Kansas City Chief receiver. How can I be more like that safety in my daily life? And it would not be a good idea to behave like a professional football player in your daily life because – the type of behavior and attitude that is appropriate on a football field is not appropriate in 99.9% of life. The type of behavior, attitude, the language used, the approach of Red Bar and, and Howard Stern, it's appropriate for their type of show. It's not appropriate for most people most of the time. And I, I don't believe that they're like this when they're off the air. So not not a big fan of taking this crushing attitude into real life, just like I don't think it's a good idea to take the the behavior of professional football players and try to imitate that in your real life. Dub bears. And that's why everyone's so weird and icky. I don't want to invite bears here. This is an upscale affair. But uh, Owen, I think he's taken some time off, and I think he's learned a few things from me. Let's hear what the most based Nazi on the internet thinks of me. And you might ask, no one really knows, but we'll talk about it. And we'll talk about, oh, and I checked out, um, every now and then I like to check in on this dude, Red Bar. Ah, every now and then I like to check in on this dude, Red Bar. How do I look? How do I look today, Owen? Hmm. Uh, not to your liking. Well, you're wrong. I also live near woods. I'm also into farms and horses, stuff like that. Uh, I'm a friend to all this, and I can be friends with Tim Heidecker and Owen Benjamin. I actually uh, do a thing where I invite them both over. I tell Owen, hey, you want to come over and talk about Jews? And I'm just like, he goes, yes. I go to Tim, I go, hey, Tim, you want to come over and talk about how cool Sarah Silverman can be? Oh, yeah. And then they both. It's called Mike's house. They bump into each other. Yeah, it's called Mike's house. And they bump into each other, and then uh, they become really good friends. They put everything aside. I think it could happen. It could happen, but only under my wing. You know, is there anybody bringing together both sides of the aisle like me? I there isn't. So. There isn't. It should be respected. It should be awed. It should be bowed to. And, you know, I could get the, uh, the, the the worst liberals in the world. They love Red Bar. And the worst people, they're banned from every platform, deplatformed. They're terrorist organizations in themselves. They're also in love with what I do. You're not finding many people who fit that uh, that builder. So let's hear Owen Benjamin on me, the mighty and powerful Red Bar. Oh, and I checked out, um, every now and then I like to check in on this dude, Red, Red Bar. Bar. He's funny. He's really good at making comedians. Oh. I don't like checking in on... He's on the funny. Tim Dillon just said I was funny last week. Then Big J. Who else? Who else likes me? Obama and Trump, maybe. <laughs> Who else? Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris and the black chick from our last episode. Nicaragua. What is her name? Who? The black chick with Brian Callen. What is her name? Oh, Candace. Candace Nicaragua. She's she changed her it. name. They all love it. I'm the true middle. The real middle. Malcolm in the middle. Comedy scenes, it's so dark and, and gross. But sometimes I just want to know what's happening out there. And uh, he's pretty good at, at figuring out what, what, what everyone's doing. And he just like makes fun of them. And so sometimes I find that cathartic. Huh? And man, is it dark out there for the comedians. And I listen to, because I would never listen to a Sarah Silverman podcast ever. It's just too Cheers, dark. Everyone. It would, to love it would, and it would ownership. Lower my vibe. It would just, I don't know. I'm just not, like some people are good at, uh, some people are good at being able to dive into that stuff and make fun of it and everything. I can't even listen to it. Like it bothers me. And so I checked out a couple of his episodes me. where he was talking about what's going on in New York City comedy, which is insane. Yes. It's all gone. And then also, I mean, I'm just making up the best sounding story. It's unbelievable that everyone believes it. Well, it comes true. Well, it does so come often. true. Listen, I make up everything that I say. A week later, it happens, and then everyone thinks that I'm like covering the news as it happened. Very weird. You know, Owen, a lot of people, they're very conflicted because Owen, deep down, is a nice guy. Here's what happened with Owen he got bested, he got fronted on by a lot of people. So he became the opposite to what those people were in the worst way. But deep down, he's always been a very sweet person, and it's troubling. You know, he's just so stubborn. He won't allow himself to be that. He won't apologize for all the insanity that has come out of his mouth. I mean, really, he said some insane, dark, I like scary it when he plays the piano. stuff. But that then at the same the time, boom, it's like Tom Green. Some, You know, I was never a fan of Tom Green until now, and I think that's really interesting. And I wonder if people are as open to becoming a fan of somebody after knowing them for 15 years and not being interested at all. I watch Tom Green now, and I see somebody that I feel like there's like love in him. There's a goodness in him that I'm attracted to that I never think about the old Tom Green with the short hair. Who cares? Stupid, right? And then all of a sudden, like something clicks, and then Tom Green is, but you can't even describe it. I think people are redeemable. They change. And I think you can. Now, is this redeemable? I mean, God forbid, I haven't even heard half the things he said. What I've heard is, yikes. I'm sure he's just been saying nice stuff since we saw him last time. I'm going to assume he's nice now, you know. But that would be like if somebody said, oh, is Mike nice now? And I'd be like, well, everything I said was nice. It's always been nice. <laughs> you know, but he has said something. Six million wasn't enough is a slogan <laughs> that I think he created. I mean, it really is crazy. And the people that he's encouraged, you know, just some really bad stuff. But I don't think, I never thought that he was actually bad. I think he's just lost. 
Uh, you know, he's going to hate me for saying something like that. This sounds like concern trolling, like Sam Tripoli did to him. He does hate it when people do concern trolling. He does, but it's, it's, that yeah, of course. But so look at his face, that. but look at his eyes. Don't you want to hang out with him and cuddle up with him? He looks pretty cuddly. Wouldn't you want to eye cuddle up right here? And again, this is this so scale. Tall, he's like he's so tall. Feet tall. We could both fit on both his lap once and both rest our heads on his shoulders. And he's like, you guys nice. are the best. And he's being nice the whole that time. That kind of sounds fun. It sounds great. And we're on his farm and it's a beautiful day. It's freezing, but it's beautiful. His wife is cooking us an amazing meal. Flapjacks, as many flapjacks as we could stack. And he's cutting them with a hatchet and his kids are dead because I don't want to be living with his kids. Okay, yeah, uh, Whit Stillman, the movie director, says on Twitter, has Twitter really suspended Roger Friedman's Showbiz 411 account? For calling out HBO and the Woody Allen hit job. Wow, read Moses Farrow's true account. So, right, Roger Friedman's currently suspended on Twitter because he defended Woody Allen and uh, criticized Mia Farrow. Whit Stillman notes those behind the Woody Allen HBO hit job also made the widely discredited campus rape documentary, The Hunting Ground, similarly smearing the innocent. For ideological game. Okay, Whit Stillman on Twitter. So I want to be the kid. I want his kids dead so I can be his child. Well, they can just go to summer camp. No, I Come want on. his kids in coffins, and I want it to be. And don't take offense to this. I want it to be like that movie. Um, was that summer? Midsummer. Midsummer. But his kids are in caskets, and we're all okay with it. And they're rotting away in front of us, but we're all just being a family and dancing around the corpse of his kids. Like it's part of the plan. It's part of it all. I don't agree with this. He all. lives in a midsummer style town <laughs> area. Now let's hear what else he says about me going on in New York City comedy, which is insane. They say, oh, I love this fantasy. Mersh is fuming. I love this fantasy. Mike, hug, hug him. See how I bring people together. Now, remember this when I start with Tim Heidecker. Don't turn on me. Don't. Look at that face, by the way. Cute. He's harmless. Keep going. They want to know more about the fantasy. <laughs> the kids' bones turn into our tools as we need all the resources we could get. So we have to use his kids' skulls as things, you know, that we use around the house to build things. We use his kids' bones, leg bones as hammers. You can use my skull. Save the kids. Yeah, listen, if you have a problem with that, then you ain't about free speech. <laughs> And then also Sarah Silverman. And how they view black people is so insane to me. Isn't Silverman on the Nasally Network? Good one, Coddington Bear. And by the way, if you want to uh, tip me and Coddington Bear. It's like him and Melton I uh, went the same route for their studio here. As you can see, this wood. His looks nicer. More authentic. Look nice. More authentic. You don't need pink lights mixed with wood. It doesn't work. I like Owen. And I like his wife. You know, I like that smile of hers. I like, to, I like a smile sex. I think she's a nice wife if she like sticks her. with him through all this. Fuck her. She's a true family woman. And I love uh, his family, too. And I'd bring those kids back. I'd resurrect your son. Entropystream.live slash mobile slash Owen Benjamin Comedy. Does that change every day, Coddington? Let's so Coddington's half, and, that, and that's instant. You can do it right now. And if you want to, uh, some gravel for my babble, uh, it's P.O. Box 490, Sandpoint, Idaho, 83864. Uh, that link seems odd. Yeah, I don't know. It's, you're, he hasn't you're been banned from the Postal Service yet? Wow, the Postal Service is a bunch of alt-right Nazis. They let him have a box there in Idaho? You can't take the post away from a man. Uh, that's crazy that you can't be banned by the post office yet, you know? Uh, man, I would really like to bring him in and have him be my co-host like Crowder tried. He could write for the show with me and really try to turn it around. I hope he doesn't think I'm uh, mocking him today or making fun of him. Well. well I'm not, <laughs> being honest. And I'd like to become one with you. And your I have a family, too. I I'm not saying that my you. family, I'll kill my dog, you know. We all have all, to do this together. It's like a part of what it's we a do. Thing. Yeah, I'm not saying your kids are dead and we're mocking their, their death. We're all part of this. It's Our part of the thing. Because we can't have kids. We got other shit to talk about, right? We don't have time for the kids. The kids are in our way, bro. They're we must time. send your kids into that creek by your farm. Let's put them on their backs and go, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Push them out like Jesus did to his kids and push them down the river and we'll fire rounds into them as they fade into the distance and we won't see them Whoa. get blown away because they're too far. And then we'll be free from these fucking kids and we'll be able to really build up this fucking barn and get the animals all working with us. If you didn't have kids, this barn could be yeah. two stories. Exactly. If you didn't have kids, think about how far we could get and it'll be me, her, you and her and we'll build an empire. We'll build a skyscraper barn bigger than the Sears <laughs> Tower. You ever, that is something to strive for. A barn skyscraper. It is 157 stories of barn material, <laughs> and the spires on the top are made out of haystack circle. Okay? And we will build a beautiful New York skyline barn edition that no one has ever seen. It's a whole city that we build out of barn material. And then we kill our kids, and I'll kill my dog. To be. Oh! You don't like this? I think that when he hears the barn part, he's going to be, he'll be in Yeah, it. and guess what? You have to be for it. Otherwise, free speech dies. And then what good is gab? If I can't even say this. So let's hear his rest about me. Running this chat. Like, you're doing all of this. So if you say the link appears odd, the pinned, the pinned message you did. Yeah, PO Box 490, Sandpoint, Idaho, 8386. Let's send him something yeah, nice. Link. Let's send him a gift to show our uh, appreciation. What PO Box like? 498. Let's send, let's send him. him some Teddy Fresh. He doesn't like merch. He loves bears. Let's send him like 10 grand worth of. Melton's mystery boxes. Yeah, yes. It's just. <laughs> Mystery box after mystery box of NLO swag. 
I don't know what to send them, but if you guys could help me, let's send them a nice like, gift. Let's send them homes, a gift, a peace offering to come back. Do people know what he would like? Why don't people get any second chances? Like, what if he came out and said, I am so sorry, everything that I said was so stupid. Can I just please have a second chance? Like, nobody gets a second chance, which is weird. Not that anybody's been, you know, like, uh, deserving of it. Nobody's even tried. But surely there's got to be a second chance for people. He's so cute. You know, what if he were to say, I'm so sorry for all the bullshit that I said. I just want a second chance. Can I please come back to Facebook? I promise I won't do any of that. I'm so, I was so stupid. I was making mis You just can never come back. That's what turns these people into pure villains. Not that they want to be good. What None of them have ever tried to be good. I'm just saying what if they did try to be good. What did they call it in that Rogan Twitter episode when they kept on being like, is there any chance for... Yeah, redemption. Re yes, redemption. A road to redemption. Road to redemption. Jack, redemption. First, you know who I'm a huge fan of? People are going to hate me for this. My biggest idols in this world are Twitter's Jack Dorsey and uh, Jack Zuckerberg from Facebook. I think they're really good. I'm huge fans of them. <laughs> is anyone fans of that? These guys, I can't see. I can't see a thing. Imagine if I was like a huge Jack Dorsey supporter and fan. Like about anyone... like people who fanboy over Elon Musk yeah, who like are a fan Jack of Dorsey. Mark Zuckerberg. I love, but not... In so uh, Facebook is going to start uh, labeling posts about climate change, all right? And uh, Facebook will soon add labels, links to posts about climate change. So you're no longer going to be able to argue against uh, climate change on Facebook. Not an ironic Jesse P.S. stolen from Sam Hyde, by the way. And Sam Hyde agrees, and he's pissed, and that's what... You know, people go, why isn't Sam Hyde as good as he used to be? Well, all this shit's been stolen. He, can't, he doesn't know what to do. People, you know, not everyone's like me, where you could just come up and evolve with new things every minute that you're being stolen People from. People are saying you should buy Owen an expensive grill. I'd like to send him. I don't know what to give him. Why do you, what do you give the man that has it all? What do you give the man that has everything? I'd like to give him $1 million. If you guys can find out what his dream gift would be, we'll get it for him. We will get it for him. Wouldn't you like to see this guy, like, just with a clean slate? Yes. Yeah, I really would like to see that. Let's hear. He's going to talk more about us. Pinned to the top of the chat. Thank you. The buck stops in my bucket. We'll get to your bucket. Oh, and why we should, no one should invade America. We have a funny uh, meme about that. Sarah Silverman is everywhere. Buy him a baby's coffin. Oh, I will. Let's send him a baby's, a vintage baby's coffin from the 20s. We'll find it on Etsy. <laughs> Go to, I'm so sorry. I don't do that. I don't burp. I don't even sweat. You know, so I'm sorry about doing any of that. Type up baby coffin on Etsy. Let's see if we could. I'll ship him one. No, but can that be a threat? Yes. But he doesn't have a baby. That's Kids terrible. too tall for these coffins that I'm willing to send, that I'm fixing to send. I'm going to send him two baby coffins. That's terrible, As a man. metaphor to how... Whoa, I, I got to disavow. ...wing or white nationalist fantasy. It's just going to all collapse and whoever has the mm -hmm. most guns wins and we'll all be living in little hovels and, you know, okay, that probably, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> and I don't really want that to happen either. Um, but, you know, Planet of the Apes notwithstanding. But, you know, <laughs> if we're going to exist in this world, we are going to have to be cleverer than other people. And the people who are masters of language and symbol and spirit and art are going to dominate the grugs. And that is how it's going to be. This is where I would push back again against a man I admire and who indeed I consider a friend, Ed Dutton, who kind of, you know, I, I think he, he, and I think other conservatives kind of, I, he's not quite conservative, but other conservatives will, will kind of tell themselves the story that like, oh, the religious one here at the earth and uh, the people who are most based in this way are going to have the most kids and so on. Even if that is true, and I, and I think that is true on, on a certain level, even then they would never dominate and never have their own future. There would be an elite ruling them because that's how it goes. And so, I mean, this is something that my Farmers friend have been calling Mark Roman stresses, and it's something absolutely true. I mean, we have to engage in this realm of the psyche. And we can, you know, conservatives, again, are, are just, they, they just, they don't like it. And I, I remember even this back in my, like, alternative right.com days or ratings days or whatever, you know, when I would publish, like, a movie review or I talk about either pop culture or high culture or talk about something a little off the beaten track, you'd always get this. They're like, there are illegal aliens invading our country right now, and you're doing a review of Batman, you know, how <laughs> dare you, you know? And I guess to some, in, you know, I, I see their point, but... Uh, you know, I think the, the fact that they endlessly focus on that kind of stuff is why they will lose. Yeah, you're engaging in intellectual pursuits instead of reacting to reality. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? You can't, you can't do that. The, the right is just uh, absurd, really. And the, it's funny because their critique of the left is their absurdity. And of course, there is a, a lot of absurdity on the left. Truth, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, mean, think I think this is, the, this is the opportunity in some ways, because I, I do think that the excesses of wokeism and, and just this like puritanical streak that has clearly possessed them and not to mention the other kind of problems of mass immigration and fragmentation and so on that that creates. I think there is actually an opportunity here. Like there, there's, a, there's a kind of crack in the hegemonic structure. But unless you're able to replace it and fight back on it on, on a, the, the deepest levels where it needs to be fought back, it, it, it's not going to really matter. Like they're going to get away with wokeism. And there are already people within the establishment who are kind of slamming the brakes on woke cancel culture because they, they're foresighted enough to kind of realize that this is in fact hysteric. And it, this, this is not leading towards stability and the maintenance of our power. Indeed. And uh, something you've talked about a lot lately that is uh, very accurate is how deep the polarization of our country runs and not just politically, but everywhere. Like there is a, a horrendous split <laughs> to say yeah. the least. Everything's and, um, Indeed, indeed. You can, even, even children shows. But yeah. um, wearing a mask also, became a right-left concept. 
You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it, there's nothing that escapes it. And um, actually, someone who was, who was on my, my private group the other time this morning, that there, there's almost this way of, like, we've, we've, the media has kind of created Frankenstein's monster in the sense that there, there's almost, like, more people who will engage in, like, meta-analysis of something than will engage in the thing itself. Like, more people will watch a, like, cinema sends or, like, everything wrong with, you know, you've probably seen those videos on YouTube. Where they'll like they'll go into a movie and kind of make fun of all the little things. These are yeah, millions yeah. of views. More people will, will will like watch that or watch some kind of derivative of it than they'll watch the actual film. And like with like the Gina Carano situation, like yeah, okay, I mean on a basic level, this woman who was just kind of tweeting Republican tweets, like you know she was trying to mm -hmm. actually uh, butter herself up to um, the Jewish people in fact with that Holocaust tweet. Um, you know I don't want her. She doesn't deserve to be fired for that. Of, of, course, of course I agree with that. Um, but you know more people are now kind of obsessed with this than we're actually watching that show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or who actually care about it. it. It becomes, it's like this meta analysis. I mean, it was like with, with someone like Tim Poole, again, this guy who I, I, I mean, I just have to say, I've, I, I don't really have anything against him personally. Um, I've met him a couple of times and he's just, you know, the essence of mediocrity. I don't, I don't really care. I don't have a strong opinion about him personally either way, but like he, he'll do these videos where he'll just misrepresent the news and spin it and give like a cope blanket to Republicans. It's, it's just, it's, it's freaking obvious what he's doing. But that kind of meta thing, like the alternative media is bigger than the media. That, he, he is getting more combined views than like the New York Times you know, YouTube channel or, or some video that the New York Times puts up about, you know, the problems of being homeless in New York City and, you know, all, you know, that, those kind of thoughtful, well photographed you know, things that they do. Uh, he, he's getting a lot more of that. And, and he is an, and, and he's kind of a derivative of a bigger thing going on. But that, that kind of like meta reaction is bigger than the thing itself. Remarkable. Indeed. But uh, again, like that, uh, that deep polarization uh, where everything is left and right, it also presents a, a unique opportunity because it's leaving this huge void in the center. Yeah. And that's somewhere where uh, a very strong progressive intellectual movement could perhaps win with reason i hope so um I, I i truly hope so um i think joe biden won to a very large extent because he grabbed the center mm -hmm. and I, I think this is i mean and again he's he's not uh, exactly pursuing reason to its uh you know, <laughs> full <laughs> culmination yeah uh, but you know but, but he kind of is in the sense that he won because he was viewed as reasonable i think a, a hyper polarizing candidate would not have been able to beat trump who was hyper hyper polarizing just polarization on the next level like we've never yeah. seen before and he even cranked it up like he was at 11 like he cranked you know what is that joke from spinal tap like this one, this one goes to 11 or like he turned it to 11 in 2016 and then like 2020 it was like it was like 12 13 i mean he just he he, he turned up the volume of of hyper polarization irrational lunatic shit the, higher than any of us ever imagined possible. I mean, it's just insane. Um, but he can't, even that could not do it. And it's definitely not going to work in 2024, uh, either with Trump due to just gradual demographic situation and, um, and just the fact that he lost, that he kind of lost a little bit of that magic and so on. He can't do it in 2024. He just simply can't. And someone else trying to do it is just going to be pathetically laughable. Any of these other Republicans going and giving these massive rallies and it, it, no one's going to just, not, no one's going to watch. No one's going to care. It's going to be a joke. Uh, so he, while dialing up polarization to 15, he still wasn't able to beat the man who was promising the center. And you, you won't, because that, that is, I mean, I agree, like, and, and you hear this a lot, like we live in clown world, everyone's going crazy. Uh, both of us, I, I'm sure, agree with that to some extent. I mean, the level mm -hmm. of hysterical puritanism is, is really wild. But the vast majority of humans and the vast majority of humans who are, you know, uh, functional and vote and are successful in some small way do not want that. And they are not crazy woke lunatics. And they do want the center in the sense. They do want rationality or reasonableness. And um, I, I do think that like someone's going to have to break this on, at some point. I think Biden kind of did in his goofy way, is that he kind of broke the left-right divide and reached the center. Um, but the person who's able to do that will be successful at becoming hegemonic in the future. But it's certainly not going to be the right. Why not us? Well, us, that's different. Hopefully we'll do it. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> what I mean is the American right as it is. Like it, the, the yeah, shit yeah, yeah. right, the Trump MAGA, the Trumpian right, white populism, all, all of this shit is, it is a symptom of hyperpolarization. It is not an attempt to get beyond it. And it, it won't, it can't. I'm surprised it went as far as it did. And it almost won this election. Very close. But that was, that was at a point of like all guns firing. You know, that, that was like the team, you know, they, they had 12 men on the field. They were cheating. They, they were doing trick plays. I mean, they, they did everything that they could and it was not good enough. And they can't do that again. There's not, Trump himself can't do it again. There's not another Trump in the wings. I mean, maybe, I don't know someone else who could come out of the woodwork who's like Trump. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it can't do it. it, it someone is going to establish some kind of center and that will be a new hegemony. And I do think that there's a gaping hole waiting for it. And um, whether we can try to climb in there is kind of up to us. I mean, there, there's a lot of obstacles and it's very difficult, but that's at least the way, I would just say that's at least the way that we should be thinking. Absolutely. And uh, going back a bit, like talking about language and uh, psychology and philosophy and whatnot, we, we need to shift that way and think that way. Okay, that's enough. So David French has weighed in on uh, Rush Limbaugh. He says, uh, Rush shaped and mirrored his generation, the angriest conservative generation. Ideas took a backseat to opposition. Well, what's more important, 
philosophical principles or your interests, right? Philosophy or survival? What's more important to you, principles or pragmatism? Are you primarily about principles or are you primarily about your interests? David French writes, ideology is malleable. The confrontation is mandatory. That's the migration rush made. That's the migration that millions made. So David French says it's almost impossible to conceive of the pre-rush Limbaugh media environment. It was as if we lived on a different planet. You read your morning paper. You watched the evening news. Maybe you subscribed to Time or Newsweek. Maybe you got the National Review or, or the New Republic, but completely different planet before Rush Limbaugh. And uh, David French says, my exposure to conservative commentary was the library's copy of National Review combined with a few syndicated conservative columnists like uh, George Will. You just could not marinate in politics prior to Rush Limbaugh. Even when CNN debuted, Rush blew up this world. He nuked it from orbit. Wasn't just that his show was popular. Rush Limbaugh created an industry. That industry created a lifestyle. It's the lifestyle we see now where a person comes home from work, turns on Fox News, and he does not turn it off until he goes to sleep, where a person never flips the dial from their favorite talk radio station, or where someone rolls from podcast to podcast, live stream to live stream, or while the phone is in their hands scrolling through Facebook and Twitter. Is there a Roger Ailes and a Fox News without Rush? Perhaps the same? Absolutely not. So Rush did not just lead and shape a generation of political commentary. He also reflected and followed his audience. Rush put his audience first. He did not get out of touch with his audience. When his audience lined up behind Trump, Rush lined up behind Trump. So his trajectory shaped and mirrored the trajectory of tens of millions of Americans. So it's the path from Dan's bake sale in 1993 to conspiracy, deep paranoia, and musings about secession in 2020. David French says, I experienced Rush in two distinct snapshots, his beginning and his end. And the differences are disturbing. First listened to Rush Limbaugh in the early 1990s when my friends told me I had to hear him. There was no Google then. You couldn't immediately research if he'd made outrageous statements. And uh, David says when he first listened to Rush, he thought, oh, here's a happy warrior. This is like Ronald Reagan with it, William F. Buckley ideology in the hands of like a bombastic WWE you know, worldwide uh, wrestling entertainer. He, he built this bond with his audience. And uh, if you liked him, you, you excused him because he was trying to, trying to be funny. Then the, the peak moment of early Rush Limbaugh happened in May 1993. A listener named Dan K called in, complained that his wife wouldn't let him pay for a subscription to the Rush Limbaugh letter. Rush suggested he hold a bake sale to raise the money, and thus Dan's bake sale was born. So it kind of personified the substance and the fun of listening to Rush. He advocated self-reliance, burnt wine Dan, used the free enterprise system to make the money. Rush built a community. Once people knew that Dan's bake sale was a thing, they drove from miles around to meet and greet fellow ditto heads. And there's always this sense of over-the-top absurdity. A bake sale, really? But thousands showed up for Rush stock, and a great time was had by all. Then once uh, David French left law school, he stopped uh, listening. Then in 2016, he turned in. He wanted to hear what Rush was saying about Donald Trump. And uh, David was surprised. It was as though Rush seemed afraid of his own audience. When Rush would offer a very mild critique of Trump's primary debate performance, and he'd get enormous blowback from his audience. And uh, Rush seemed defensive soon. He was all in with Trump and all out with never, never Trump. He embraced Michael Anton's famous Flight 93 essay with both arms. Russia's rhetoric grew increasingly catastrophic. He minimized the coronavirus. He spread election conspiracies. His anger was palpable and his ideology, well, he moved. The one time tenacious guardian of the Reagan Buckley ideological legacy became extremely flexible. It was clear what he was fighting against the elites, the Republican establishment and the left, much less apparent what he was fighting for aside from Trump. So as the 2020 election approached, there was a palpable sense of panic that America was at stake. 
Rush broke open American media, but soon enough, he was but one voice of many. He was both an architect and a product of his political generation. It was sad to see his rage and his fear. Russia's conservative generation did much to leave America a better place than they found it. They brought America back from defeat in Vietnam and corruption at Watergate. It's the generation that gave us mourning in America in 1984 and helped defeat a communist superpower without the catastrophe of World War. America is more prosperous than it was when Rush launched his career. It is more free. Crime is down. Abortion is down. Divorce is down. Protections for individual liberty are more robust than they've been in decades, but tribalism is worse and polarization is more profound. Rush was a symbol of a generation's despair, says David French. Okay, I wonder what... I mean, how important is the creation of a strong third party to change our political system? Well, I've, I haven't voted for a Democrat since before 2000. And uh, I mean, I know all of the roadblocks both parties throw up. I watched it with Ralph. Um, it's pretty vicious, including keeping them out of the debate. Uh, if you can't raise, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, you have no media access. So you can draw crowds. Ralph could draw crowds of 10,000 people, but he couldn't ever speak on a, on a televised platform. He was locked out. Um, but I think that it, I don't I don't I think asking whether it's viable, I think they, they will make it very, very difficult. Um, but the, I think the more important issue is that the failure on the left to stand by what it said it believed. I mean, the Democratic Party has betrayed every principle the left claims to support, which is why the self-identified left are a laughingstock. It's yeah. why they have no credibility. And Richard Wardy in his last book, Achieving Our Country, writes about this. He said that what happens is that uh, that hypocritical, bankrupt, spineless, self-identified left becomes hated. This happened in Weimar. It happened in Yugoslavia. And as Wardy says correctly, what, what takes place is that there's a wholesale revulsion towards these uh, self-identified liberals, but more dangerous lead to the supposed democratic liberal values that they promote. And that is what feeds these proto-fascist movements, which we saw last week. And so the failure, I mean, we should have walked out on the Democratic Party in 1994 after NAFTA and stood by the working class. And we didn't. And they know it. And I come, much of my family comes out of that lower working class in Maine. And I've seen their communities and lives. And I mean, my grandparents, my, where my grandparents' house was in Maine, the, the bank is boarded up. There was, there, was a, there was a Methodist church that caught on fire and burned. The town doesn't have the money to raise it. So it's just charred embers. I mean, it, every, there's methamphetamine labs all over the place. Uh, that's what we've done. That's what the Democratic Party has done. And the self-identified liberal class has done. And that's why they hate us. And, and frankly, we deserve to be hated. Well, I mean, I don't consider myself a liberal, but, but uh, I totally get that hatred because they continue to speak out of both sides of their mouth. They continue to speak in that traditional feel your pain language of liberalism while putting a knife in the back of these people. And they know, they know, they know. So the hatred for the Democratic Party is far fiercer because there was a time when, you know, organized labor ma mattered. It doesn't matter anymore. And that was Clinton, by the way. I, I look at, I mean, we have two quote unquote liberal presidents, let's say of the 20th century who were truly, truly dark figures. One was Woodrow Wilson and the other was Bill Clinton. So I tried to make the case of people who urged me to vote, always vote lesser two evils. And I said, you know, the, Bill Clinton was not the lesser of two evils. And they don't understand. And I try to tell them that it took a Democrat to pass NAFTA. But George Bush the first couldn't pass it. It took a Democrat blue dog to come in and give cover to the other blue dogs to go against the unions. And that's exactly what Bill Clinton and Al Gore did when they started the Democratic Leadership Council, uh, which was a response to Ronald Reagan kicking their ass for eight years. Uh, they decided to, if you can't beat them, join them. And they started the Democratic Leadership Council. And people on the executive board were right from the Koch brothers. I mean, that's who, the, that's who Bill Clinton turned into. He went on to uh, uh, gut welfare while he exploited the prison population, uh, passed NAFTA, and then he went and he deregulated Wall Street, which led to an economic collapse in, within 10 years. I mean, that's that's the that's the success. Did the Telecommunications Act, which now you can't get the truth about anything. Um, yeah, and let's not it was all Biden. Biden was instrumental in all of that. Yes, yes. So my point is Wait. that they're, they're not the lesser of two evil, right? Well, you know, the problem is the problem is that most of the self-identified left, and I live in Princeton, they're all you know mostly liberal Democrats. They have no relationships with people who have been victimized right. by this system, and so for them it's all an abstraction. I teach in a prison, mm -hmm. so what in the early seventies, three hundred thousand people in the prison system. By the time the omnibus crime bill, which Biden pushed through, and Biden used to go around bragging that he'd increased death penalty laws, federal laws by over fifty. I mean, he used to brag about yes. this. The whole militarization of police that was. Biden, uh, Biden shepherded that through. So I come out of that prison, I, at least half my students, probably more, wouldn't even be there if it wasn't for Clinton and Biden. And the devastation that that has visited on them, on their families. And remember, you know, almost half our prison population never committed a violent crime. They're, they're locked up. You got people, I, I've taught people locked up. They can't get parole. They're locked up for life on drug charges. This is ridiculous. But that's all Biden. I, and, and so when you have a relationship with people who have been, their lives have been destroyed, how can you then go out? I mean, I also spent a lot of time in Gaza. I, I can't betray these people. And, and the fact is that these, the self-identified liberal class who pretends that they care about all of these issues, uh, through their money, through their support, and through their shaming of people who don't fall into line behind the Democratic Party establishment, uh, are have been have completely written themselves out of the political landscape. They have no relevance anymore at all, nor should they. So uh, what do you see going forward? I see uh, exactly as predicted, the Democrats will be wiped out in 2022 in the House and the Senate, and then they will lose the presidency to a more competent uh, Donald Trump, and, unless they lose it to Donald Trump himself. Uh, what, what do you see going forward? Yeah, well, Biden is like, uh, go back and look at Weimar. 
1932, von Papen takes power and he wants to bring back the Ancien Regime, which is exactly like Biden. He wants to recreate the Clinton-Obama era. Uh, and uh, it's this kind of conservative utopianism, which we isn't going to be achieved. Uh, so it does it does two things. One, uh, it, it uh, further pushes a huge segment of the population uh, towards extremism because they feel completely locked out. Their voices are locked out by digital platforms. They're ridiculed on mainstream media. Uh, they believe, you know, that the election was stolen from them. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and the other thing that it does is uh, see the ground for somebody who can do this with some competence of Tom Cotton. I mean, these are, you know, Trump, uh, he had the attention span of a four-year-old. He was utterly inept. He was incapable of organization. He was, you know, he was, you know, to call a fascist. He had no real ideology. Uh, his ideological void was kind of filled by Christian fascism. Um, but I think that, yes, I think that the trajectory, as it looks from the Biden administration, ensures further misery, uh, further dislocation, especially with the economic fallout from the pandemic, which is already severe. Uh, and people, as Barbara Ehrenreich said, being part of the working poor in the United States is one long emergency. That's right. Uh, all of that's gotten much, much worse and I think will get worse. Uh, Biden uh, will uh, uh, be far more aggressive in terms of shutting down voices on the left than Trump. Uh, and, uh, you know, there aren't many, frankly, but people like Matt Taibbi, people like Glenn Greenwald certainly will be targeted. Uh, uh, I mean, look what happened at The Intercept. There's the perfect example of the bankruptcy of the self-identified left. I was a journalist I for many most of my life. And what Glenn did was report the facts. And uh, and and then when they wouldn't publish his story about the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop, you would interview Glenn. So, you know, all this. Uh, what did they do? I mean, he published the traffic. So it was incontrovertible. That it was censorship. I read it. I mean, but the, what did Betsy Reed and all these people at The Intercept do? They went after him personally. It was really outrageous. Yes, I know. That's right. Respond to the facts. It was character assassination. And so uh, I think what we'll see is, um, especially as things unravel, um, all of the Silicon Valley, which is uh, essentially tied with the Democratic Party corporate establishment, will be used uh, heavily against the left. I think that the divisions will grow within the country. I think the economic crisis, uh, and who knows when we'll ever get COVID under control, I think all of these will combine uh, to see the rise probably of somebody who, uh, you know, when they carry out, when they carry out something, this wasn't an insurrection, by the way, but when they carry out an insurrection that'll work, uh, uh, you know, they, and they're there. I mean, there's some very malevolent political figures lurking on the fringes of the landscape, uh, Mike Pompeo, or it may just be somebody we don't even know yet. Uh, but I, I think that's, I think that's it. I think this is kind of, you know, uh, game, the game's over. Um, and, um, you know, the tragedy is that we didn't, ha weren't able to put, uh, uh, the Democratic Party would have never allowed allow it to happen, but we weren't able to put in a, a figure like Sanders or others. Of course, but the problem with Sanders, he'd be largely paralyzed by Congress. But to push through the kinds of radical New Deal type reforms, although is universal health care radical? I mean, every industrialized country has it. It's radical, it's not like radical. Okay, All right, David let's talk Packman. to some folks from the audience to hear what is on folks' minds. Another very busy week of news with more upcoming and many different things going on, including great news on uh, vaccinations, COVID cases declining, but still many challenges ahead and uh, so many different things going on. We will do it via Discord, as we have been doing for several months, and it is working It's working well, I would say. DavidPacman.com slash Discord. Let's go first to Anna from Vietnam. Anna from Vietnam, you're on the air. Oh, hello. Yes, how are you? Oh, I'm so, I'm sorry, I'm getting so nervous. No, please, don't I'm be nervous. How are you? I'm nervous because we've never had a caller from Vietnam before. Yeah, I'm nervous because this is the first time I've ever made a call to anyone kind of famous before. Oh, I, was, I thought you were going to say this is the first time you've ever spoken to anyone via digital means. I was going to be surprised. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that we are. So what's going right on? What, uh, what can I do for you, Anna? Um, but yeah, I have like heard and I've seen like in some social media that there, there's been an uprising racism against Asian people in the US. Yes. So I want to know if you acknowledge that and I want to know what are your thoughts about it. I yeah, I, I believe that. I mean, listen, I have no personal. I follow the science and the data. And a number of uh, well-respected um, organizations that track hate incidents have seen that since the start of the pandemic in the United States, there have been significantly larger numbers of um, hate incidents against Asian folks. Uh, believed, Anna, to be because Donald Trump kept talking about China, 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 the China virus, the Kung flu, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, um, I mean, my view is that it's disgusting and it's despicable and that we should be able to simultaneously say China's not being transparent. We have a diplomatic problem with China without fomenting random attacks on Asian people in the street. You know, these are two different things. It's disgusting. Yeah, I understand. And uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that we are not like being super convicting on this. I know that is not like the best source to get your information from, like from just social media in general, because I have heard a lot of people like having um, like actual thoughts about it via like science stuff and paperwork and yeah. things like that. But to be able to like have it so obvious that even the sources that are not supposed to give you like specific and very accurate information about it, like talking about it is quite huge, you know? And um, to me, the America has always been a place where you can be free and not uh, Kind of like achieve your American dream. So mm. to see that happen to my people is very upsetting and very unsettling in uh, a way. I completely agree with you and, and understand how, how horrible that must be. Anna, you speak beautiful English. How? Wait, tell us about how did you, did you learn English in school in Vietnam? Oh, uh, I, <laughs> um, so this <clears throat> because yeah, I formulated my thoughts. Okay, what's going on with speech on That's universities? There's a very big problem with free speech on campus. You mentioned in your trail there that I've been no platform for my feminist views. Um, it's it's not just about no platforming. Prominent individuals like me get no platformed, but there's a culture of fear within our universities, particularly among feminists and some other groups. Um, I've, I've seen it myself. 
members of staff refused to debate my views with me. Um, I've been subject to staff and student complaints about recent research that I led into the reasons why we should collect uh, data on sex in the UK census. Um, it just goes on and on. And, and the thing is that I'm in a very privileged position. I'm a professor at an elite university, and yet my employer has never put out an unequivocal statement of support um, with for me. The position for casualised staff and for students is far worse, and the idea that there's no problem is a nonsense. You know, just last week, a new website called GC Academia Network was set up. I don't know the founders, but what I do know is that in just a few days, they've had 70 anonymous testimonials put on their website by staff and students who have similar views to myself, who say that they've been frozen out of, of professional networks, that they're frightened to teach their subject, that they're constantly made aware that there will be complaints made against them. And, and universities simply are not upholding freedom to debate. Sad. Okay. Let's uh, speed it up here, guys. Here we go. What the heck? Oh, I know what's wrong. I didn't have the volume turned up. Oh, come on, mate. I think that's probably the best thing. I mean, to understand people, it's it's remarkable how few people you can really understand in a lifetime. So I think the, the biggest gap between me being a successful uh, YouTuber, podcaster, and uh, my, my present situation is my absolute callous, utter and total disregard for my audience. So I've been listening to a podcast series called Pod School by this uh, lovely Australian woman. Her, her name's uh, Rachel Corbett. And uh, <laughs> And she says the most important thing for, for starting a, a, a podcast is to think about your listener. Get a very specific idea of your listener. And that's how you set yourself up for podcasting success. And I, I listened to that and I think, wow. I mean, I, I listen to all the comments and I listen to all the feedback I get. And I, I read the chat. So, so that's all, all important to me, but I, I just have this utter disregard for what does the audience want? I, I just come on here and do my thing. And so that's just like caveman Luke, right? That, that, that's probably the biggest obstacle between where I am now and where I perhaps could be is my just utter callous disregard to the audience like I, i'm interested in your feedback i love hearing what works what doesn't work but on the other hand when I'm, I'm getting ready to do a show i don't think about oh what will my audience want or what topics would my audience like me to cover or you know what perspective would my audience want me to have on the voter fraud right i, I just have complete disregard so if if all of my audience thinks one way about voter fraud. I'm perfectly happy to come on here and tell you what I think. So Rush Limbaugh kind of chased his audience. He never wanted to risk alienating his audience. And uh, I've, I've done a really good job of alienating my audience. So if you ever wondered, how can you set yourself up for podcasting success? Oh. Got dreams of being a professional podcaster, but have no idea what you're doing? This is impossible. That's about to change. A new kind of school. Welcome to the Pod School Podcast. Hello. Today's show is all about how to set yourself up for podcasting success because you know I don't want you to fail. I'm very interested in you being a successful podcaster, and the way you do that is by having a high quality show. But before I get to that, Exciting news. My online podcasting course, Pod School, is now open. You can check out all the details at podschool.com.au. You don't have to join the wait list anymore because it is open and you can jump straight in right now if you are ready to get started. So I would love to help you get your show out to people's ears. Not only would I love to show you the nuts and bolts of how to do that, but also the best practice way to do that Maybe so I that you can make sure that if you are course. going to be a podcaster, you are a successful one. Enrollments close this Friday, October 9th. Uh -oh. So. Oh. If you want to jump in, I would love to see Darn. you inside the course. I might have so it. let us talk about some of the things you can do apart from joining me in pod school, of course, to make sure that your podcast is a success. I know I mentioned this so many times on like a bloody broken record, 
But when you are coming up with your idea, please think about your audience. Think about your listeners. Think about the people that are going to be listening to your show. Design your ideal listener. Make sure you are making your decisions for them because you are much more likely to come up with an idea that people will enjoy and seek out and want to listen to if you have an audience in mind. So make sure that's at the base of everything that you do rather than your ego because that never gets us anywhere. Second thing is to choose the right podcast niche. So if you've got an idea and it's pretty broad, you've got to think about the fact that it's quite difficult to compete if there are... Okay. And you have to work at it a long time. And so when a lot of people uh, are are very much uh, dependent upon the opinions, the good opinions or, you know, (laughs) the, the, the negative feedback of others, to the extent that you depend upon others to feed your, your ego, validate you, validate you, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer because you're never going to get enough of that validation. Got dreams of being a professional <laughs> podcaster, but have no idea what you're doing. This is impossible. That's about to change. A new kind of school. Welcome to the Pod School Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. Oh, today's podcast hurts me in my little heart because I really thought that this tip was something that didn't need to be expressed. But unfortunately, I have heard this problem a couple of times on podcasts over the last sort of month. So much so that I thought, look, this even happening once to me is enough to feel like I just want to throw my little two cents in and give my recommendation and then step the heck out. Because as you know, this show, my online podcasting course, Pod School, they are all designed to rid the world of crappy podcasts. I'm all about best practice podcasting, about giving you the best chance of success by making your show as high quality and professional as possible. And I tell you what doesn't sound professional, eating on your podcast. Oh, for the love of God. I have heard this both at the amateur level and unfortunately at the very professional level. And I just wanted to add my thoughts into the ether. If you are looking for a way to really make sure that you never make your audience think, I don't think they give a crap if I'm here or not, then not eating is a great way to do that. I'm not sure if the thinking behind it is, oh, if I just chomp on something, I'll sound so relaxed. It'll be like my friends are hanging out with me that are listening to the show. I mean, that's fine if you're at the pub, but it doesn't sound relaxed. It sounds disrespectful if you're doing it on a podcast. And it just makes an audience feel like, I don't think that they really have thought about me at all. So if you want your audience to feel like you are doing the show for them, Slurping and jumping into their ears ain't the way to go about it. From time to time, I'll actually get people um, who will send me ideas for their podcasts. And something that comes up every now and then is this idea of sitting down around with people, drinking and eating and talking about stuff. And my general advice on that is nobody likes to hear people eat and drink. (laughs) It's okay to watch sometimes, but when you just remove any of the visuals and you just have the... Yeah, I remember this, Sheila said in the comments how how disgusting it was watching me eat while doing the show and so i reflected on that i prayed on that i I realized she was right sound of the slurping and the chomping as a listener it's not a terribly enjoyable experience it doesn't add anything to the show for me it might add something to the show for you because you're having a couple of vinos and a cheeky cocker van or something but for a listener it really doesn't add to their experience so as a blanket rule i mean ultimately look you've been listening to this show for a while, you will know that my advice is just to be taken and then used in the way that you see fit because it is your podcast and whatever you decide is your decision ultimately. But I would just be avoiding eating. If you're hungry, I mean, you don't need to starve to death. You know what I'm saying? If you're hungry, have a muesli bar before you get started. Or if you are absolutely screaming for something to eat, press stop, have a little nibble and press record again. You're all Okay, I'm taking those you. words they to heart. You. They've got their own stuff to deal with. They're looking for validation from you, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's just a, a torture. It's a torment, I think, to um, not realize that. Uh, it's a torment to go through life craving validation from others that they can't really give you or they can't give you to the extent that you need or for the reasons that you really need and so forth. So yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a huge realization to have. It's a, nobody will love you as much as you think you should be loved. 
Got dreams of being a professional podcaster, but have no idea what you're doing? This is impossible. That's about to change. A new kind of school. Welcome to the Pod School Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. Today's tip is going to be very quick because I'm going to just focus on one very small but very important thing. I get a lot of emails from people wanting to repurpose content that they already have potentially on a blog or the other day I got an email from someone who had some lesson plans they wanted to transform into a podcast. And one of the interesting and slightly dangerous things I find a lot of people do is that they are reading old content and putting it onto a podcast and then wondering why it A, sounds bad and B, doesn't work. So I wanted to just dedicate an entire episode of the show to this piece of advice. Please do not read on your podcast. Reading is one of the quickest ways to disconnect you from your audience. And when you are trying to grow an audience and bring more people into your show through word of mouth, the only way you can do that is if you are really connecting with them and delivering really high quality, engaging content. And there is just nothing engaging about listening to somebody read. When you are reading, you are focused on the page and not on your listener. So if you have got content already on a website or you've got something like a lesson plan that you want to share with other people, that's absolutely fantastic. In fact, if you've got a bunch of content that you can turn into audio, then you should be singing and dancing around because coming up with content is a huge reason why a lot of podcasters fade out and stop releasing episodes because they realize this was a lot harder than I thought it'd be. But if you've got a mountain of content sitting there just waiting to be turned into a podcast, that is a dream position to be in. But you do want to make sure that the content that works for you in another medium works well in audio. So the only way to do that is to actually prepare and present it in a different way. That doesn't need to be super involved. If you've got a blog post and you are sharing your expertise on that blog post, you have all of that knowledge in your head already. You just need to present it to people naturally. So turn that blog post into just a bullet point list that gives you the inspiration as you're reading through that bullet point list to just tell people what you know as you go through. So have a bit of a structure when you're going into your record, but don't sit down and write down everything word for word. If this is stuff that you are teaching, you know this stuff inside out. All you need is something to inspire you to deliver it in a really engaging way, and that is as complex often as a bullet point list. So don't make the mistake of thinking that a podcast is just an audio version of content that exists somewhere else. Reading is not engaging in a podcast, but don't feel like having to turn the content that you already have into audio content is a huge ask because it really isn't. It just means well, that you need to think about said, talking said, no to your audience as, rather than uh, talking yeah, to no a page. No one will think as badly of you as you might think of yourself. You know, exactly. and, what this is all about is self-obsession. Um, yeah. uh, one of the... Uh, uh, a good way to simplify your life and get through it is to be less self-obsessed, to, th- to be thinking less about yourself, um, good or bad, because it doesn't really matter. What, what does matter is that you are objective about what you do and how you treat other people and, and just uh, try to do the right thing. And that that is, um, and I understand why people want more than that. Like they think that they in themselves are special and important and um, interesting, and you, you know, they might well be, uh, but the world doesn't really care. That's the thing. It's sad. Even your mom doesn't care enough, generally, uh, or oftentimes. Uh, the people who are tasked to care about you. Yeah, yeah. Often I would I would remonstrate with my mother and with my family. You're not listening to me. And uh, so one of my mother's friends, finally, meaning my stepmother, finally commiserated with her and said, you know, Luke needs 500 people paying attention to him at, at all times. So, so don't take it too seriously. This is when I was bedridden by chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, my mom's friend, he, he's a wounded young guard. He, he needs to be at UCLA, have 500 people paying attention to him at the same time, then he'll be fine. Sometimes they can't, right? Or they can't do it enough. And, and that's really yeah. hard. A related, a related um, idea to this is that in, in terms of honor and dishonor, nobody else will care as much about your honor as you do. And nobody will care as much about your dishonor as you do. And that's a difficult thing to, to accept. Because you know, we live in this context where we're constantly having personal attacks being launched at us. Yeah. And it's it's terrible. It's terrible to have people who are malevolent and dishonest uh, smearing your name and so forth. And it's shocking how difficult it is, though, to get your friends, even your close friends, to, to really look at both sides of the issue or try and see things rightly and so forth. Uh, it's just very difficult. Uh, very, very few people will really sit down and listen uh, to you if you've been attacked and dishonored. And... 
that that's hard. That's just a hard lesson to learn. And this, if you learn it, it it's easier in some ways because what you do is you have a tendency not to get into sort of spiraling tit for tat back and forth uh, reprisals with people who have attacked you. You you realize that if you can't really expect even your closest friends, even your family, to to come to your side and see things fully the way that you see it, uh, it, it somewhat takes the uh, incentive out of out of going back at people like that. Um, it is kind of liberating though to know that uh, if you feel profoundly embarrassed by something, that you've really done something wrong, right? That you've dishonored yourself, that nobody's gonna care as much about that <laughs> as, as you do either. Yes. That it's going to harm you less in the eyes of other people than it does impeach you in your own eyes. There will be, I mean, there are always enemies. There are people who will make use of whatever faux pas you've made. Uh, that, that's true, but people in general don't, won't care that much. I mean, you just can't expect other people to be as emotionally invested in your problems as you are. That's a sort of inevitable thing that each individual is a, a hive of activity around uh, obsessing about what is going on to it at any one time. Mm -hmm. um, but that's too much for anyone else to take on uh, because they're dealing with their own stuff, as you said. Uh, yeah. but I do think it is important that we do try to be there for each other. I mean, that that is just a, that's obvious. But uh, yeah, yeah, there's a limit to how much you can do. Yeah, you have to be understanding about the extent to which that is difficult. But the flip side of that is, and I, I wrote about this in this little piece called uh, The Groupie Question in White Nationalism. One of the most destructive things in any political movement or social scene are people who are embittered. Uh, people who are they get involved in something like our movement uh, out of generally good motives, and they encounter people that are toxic and harmful to them, people who mistreat them. And when somebody's mistreated and nobody stands up for them, no one cares, right? Yeah. No, yes. uh, th that produces bitterness. And bitterness is a terribly destructive uh, psychological state because it turns into a kind of neurosis. What does it mean to be bitter? Well, to be bitter means to, to feel like you're a victim of some kind of injustice and the injustice has not been addressed. You know, you haven't gotten justice and you haven't even gotten sympathy oftentimes from people. Yeah. And when, when somebody is a victim of injustice and they don't get any kind of sympathy at all uh, from their social milieu, th that is a process by which they uh, basically rationalize behaving badly. Practically every, uh, every act of immorality that I can think of just in my personal sphere, it turns out it's been justified by bitterness. People say, yeah, well, um, I know I did the wrong thing, but other people have done the wrong thing to me too. And the yeah. unstated thing is, is that other people did the wrong thing to me too, and I didn't get any justice. I didn't even get any sympathy, right? And you, you can't let that fester. When you see people who are victimized, you need to step forward, right? You need to say something uh, about that. Uh, and I, I think that's important. Uh, but at the same time, they have to recognize that chances are they're, they're not going to get the understanding that they really need because other people, other people will never care as much about your suffering or your dishonor as you do. And that's, yeah. that's just inevitable, sadly. All right. It's one of those sad things about uh, existence that you, someone else's pain, uh, you can never really feel it. I mean, of course, you wouldn't want to, that's the thing. Uh, but no one else can feel your pain as much as you do. That, that's, it's, and it's just like, you can't quite believe that, but it is the truth. And I think the, the only way around that is well, either just accept it or uh, both to, um, to try to minimize it for yourself. So that, you, so that you need the other people's sympathy less. Yeah, I'm just thinking. <laughs> Sometimes I think I don't just have some snappy answer. Like, no. you know, the radio, of course, hates dead air, right? <laughs> you know, there's a, another thing, and I actually wrote an article on this called On Potential. There's another great thing that people need to learn as they grow older, which is that when you're young, potential is a wonderful compliment. But as you get older, it becomes less and less of a compliment until it becomes kind of a mockery. When you're 40 years old and people are, are raving about your potential, that's almost an insult uh, because by the time you're 40, you should have actualized some of your potentiality. And that's really how we flourish. We flourish by actualizing our potentialities for excellence. One of the destructive mentalities that has insinuated itself into our culture is, is that people want to keep their options open. Well, the trouble is, is that if you're keeping your options open, that is equivalent to not actualizing yourself because uh, you to, to really actualize yourself in some way, to really be excellent at something, you've got to devote yourself to it. And if you devote yourself to it, that means you have to basically let go of other possibilities. You will never write the great American novel and be a great pianist. There are very few people who can do great things in two or three or four areas, right? And to, to really excel, you've got to, at a certain point, decide not to keep options open. You've got to clamp down on things and pursue them single-mindedly and recognize that there's a cost to that, though, that you are going to be putting to death all these unicorns and white horses and ideal possibilities and dreams that you might have cherished uh, when you're young. But you got to do that because if you're keeping your options open at 40, that's equivalent to saying, you know, if, if the guy's 40 and people, the best they can say is he's got so much potential, that's almost like saying he's a loser. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just conscious of the fact that society now is so unsympathetic, unhelpful to young men that a lot of them do end up at 40 um, 
you know, there are 40 year olds who have never lived up to their potential. And uh, I, I would hasten to say that if you do reach 40 and all you've got to your name is potential, that is not the end of the matter. That's not the end of the story. You're not condemned to, you don't have to be like that when you're 60. You know, or 80. You don't Absolutely. have to die like yeah. that. It's very, very important to remember this because in this day and age, a lot of people really, I mean, 30 is the new 20, 40 is the new 30. Uh, you like to think that. We well, really yeah, like that. Of, course, of course, but you know what I mean. I mean, look at me. I'm not unusual anymore. You know, but when, it, when it happened to me, when I, when I fell into that way of life, it was fairly, fairly rare. But now I think it's very common for people. Like I was, I think I moved out of when I was 34. Um, yeah, yeah, I was 34. I just turned 34. Um, and uh, the, and the, the doctor forced me to leave home. But that, I mean, there are loads of guys who are 34 and living at, at home now. Um, that is not unusual anymore. And especially now with the, you know, the economic turmoil that's on the way, oh, um, yeah. it, it's going to be a far more typical thing. In fact, the, the, it might well be that that period uh, when people you know, left home in their early 20s or their late teens and never returned, that might well be something that we just associate with the 20th century in the future. I'm not sure. Um, but either way, that's not the only way that you can uh, realize your potential. Um, so there, there are other aspects to this, and I, I just think it's important that you don't fall into despair. I mean, you might well be 40 in, in, in that state. Uh, it's not too late. It really isn't too late. It's not too late, but, and you know, I, I'm sort of a late bloomer, so I know this from both sides. Uh, it's not too late, but you've got to recognize this or you won't get serious, and you do need to get serious eventually. Yeah. And this comes this comes back to what I said earlier, that you are the captain of your ship. Right. You cannot rely on the winds of fate to solve this for you or anyone, any other person. Yeah. Now, somebody in the chat says, well, we'll talk about house pricing uh, then. Well, that is an economic issue. There's no question about it. One thing I, I hasten to add is that you don't necessarily uh, have to live on your own to be actualizing yourself. A lot of people are forced by economic circumstance to live with family or friends or whatever and not be on their own. But that's still consistent with, with self-actualization in some way. It's just not following the, the path that was laid out earlier where it was possible and encouraged when you are a, an adult to go off on your own. Obviously, a lot of people's life chances are being dramatically curtailed. We need to change that. There's no question totally about shame. it. That's one of the things that popular Exposed. Has to I wonder who he's going to blame. You think it's going to be the media or the left or both? Blame the media? Blame your political opponents? Hmm. That sounds awfully... Do is make getting a uh, start in life, forming a family and things like that early on, uh, supporting a family with a single wage possible again. That should be absolutely top uh, priorities, right? So we have to address that, but it's not the same as being a loser, okay? Uh, <laughs> there can be people who are out on their own and they're just sleepwalking through life and not accomplishing stuff. So, you know, being an incel living in your mom's basement is not necessarily a loser if you're actualizing real potentialities, right? And being out on your own and making a large income and being independent is not necessarily self-actualization if you're just sleepwalking your way through life. So those those are good things. I want to thank a bunch of people, a bunch of friends who are in the chat. Carl is in the chat. Carl Thorburn, our Bitcoin guru. Gaddius Maximus is there. Uh, Nicholas Gilvey. That's, that's uh, important here. So, I want to look at a couple other questions that have popped up, if you'll give me a sec. I got a bunch here, so let me run through these and figure out what's most appropriate for uh, me and woes and what I will save for later. So HAPA Perspective writes in with three US dollars. Thank you. Telegram is the future. Uh, I would agree with that. What do you think? Oh, I love Telegram. Um, yes, I think so. Um, I think what we're, I mean, I think what we're probably going to end up with is not one single platform, but multiple platforms. And we'll probably have content creators will have ways to post all of them simultaneously. So a, a, what would have been a tweet will be a post that appears on Gab, on uh, BitChute, on Telegram, uh, and so on at the same time, and probably the same with videos as well. Um, I would imagine that there'll be desktop programs that sort of feed from one person to multiple platforms uh, so that uh, if there aren't already, that'll certainly emerge in time. So I think that Telegram probably, I hope it's there for the long term. I hope they're not going to cuck. Um, they, they certainly have a huge amount of power. They have a huge market. I mean, they actually have more users than Twitter. I was astonished to learn that a few months, uh, about a month ago. So they have, that gives them a lot of power. So I hope they realize that they don't have to cuck. They don't have to uh, give in to Silicon Valley. Uh, Is Trump on Telegram yet? There is, a, I remember in late last year finding a Trump channel that had 60,000 followers, uh, but I don't know if it was official. Um, mm -hmm. don't, I know that no, it's, Trump, Trump is Jr. not on Telegram. Official thing on Telegram. So, hmm. yeah. There we well, go. I mean, he's what, he had like 88 million followers on uh, Twitter. That's probably why they cut him off, that, that number. It, it frightened some people. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Gaddius Maximus writes it. I, I like Telegram too. Uh, I don't want to put any uh, too much trust in any one program or platform, though, because I'm just getting used to being a gypsy and hopping from one platform to another. And I think that's the best attitude. But I do think it's very important if somebody creates a way that you can cross post automatically on Gab, Twitter, Telegram, and anything else that pops up. That would be an extremely useful platform uh, in and of itself. It'd be sort of like a link tree thing where you can blast all of your stuff out. Of course, one of the one of the ways that we can avoid platforms entirely is just learning how to do RSS feeds, right? Uh, 
you'll never have to complain about uh, complain about deplatforming again if you just get all the people that you want to hear from uh, set up in some kind of RSS way. Uh, but of course, they would have to have their platforms too. It wouldn't be on social media platforms, though. Uh, so Gadia writes in with ten US dollars. Thank you, Woes. What do you think about the prospects for Gab? It's looking more impressive by the day. What is it missing, or what will it take to get a critical mass enough to discard Twitter for good? Good question. You know, if Tr I hate to start this with a negative, but if Trump had switched from Twitter to Gab um, at any point during his presidency, that would have given Gab a massive boost. Massive. Um, I think that the problem with Gab, the, the, the Heather too, at least, has been that it's it has been very much an echo chamber. You, you go there and you see people talking about certain issues, which I'm not going to specify, um, and it's in very ver verbose ways, very uh, in-your-face ways, and nor normies see that and just run a mile which means that it remains an echo chamber. And uh, that means in turn that it's not a useful platform for growth, for spreading anything, um, because you're just preaching to the converted. And, um, you know, that's, I, 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 but it, it seems that Gab is starting to overcome that now. And it seems that it's getting more of a, uh, a following. One thing it, I think is probably going to start happening, I, and this is, I might turn out to be wrong, but I think this is going to start happening. I think that the left, the non-establishment left are going to start getting censored uh, by the mainstream, by YouTube, Twitter, uh, and so on, and Facebook. Not as much as, as we have been on the right, but but close to that. And that in turn will drive them to free speech platforms. And um, that will be good for them because then we'll have robust, lively debate on those platforms again, like we used to have on YouTube and so on. And it will be free. You'll be free to do that. where You won't have to be looking over your shoulder with every, every point you make in a debate with some leftist. So I think that would be good because then you would have a sense of actual free speech instead of an echo chamber full of despondent right-wingers who've been banned from the main platforms. That's what Gab and BitChute have been, uh, or at least how they've perceivably been uh, up till now, and I hope that that's now going to change. And as I say, I think that if um, the, the mainstream left starts to clamp down on the more uh, adve intellectually adventurous people on the left, then that will drive them into these places, which will be good for them, I think. I think that's a good point. The, the reason why Gab didn't take off is that it branded itself from the very beginning as a free speech platform for dissidents, and that created a, a marginal kind of community. Yes. And I got involved with Gab and I just got bored with it. And I stopped posting there for a very long period of time. And the reason I, I did was that there just weren't enough people. There wasn't enough stuff going on. It lacked the critical mass. I didn't, I've never debated normies or liberals on Twitter. I'm just, I'm not interested in that. And so, you can't do it anyway, because it, replying to people is how you get screwed. That's what happened to me on Twitter. That's when I lost the, my first Twitter account, because I replied to someone honestly, and yeah. uh, that was offensive to them. And so yeah. I, I lost my bloody uh, 22,000 follower account, which was a big deal to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I have never gotten to 22,000. I, 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 uh, uh, I got to like 20,700 20, or something, I think. And uh, okay. it's about below 20,000 now because, well, um, people are constantly being uh, deplatformed from there. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, it, it became an, an echo chamber. It became marginal and it was boring. Then when Trump was thrown off, I thought, OK, finally, Trump will go to Gab and Gab will be vital. But no, no. Uh, Jared Kushner. Uh, was arguing with Trump, uh, prevailed upon Trump not to go to Gab because it was a right-wing echo chamber. <laughs> so you know, there's just no winning. And But I did go back to Gab at that point, and I just found that because so many people were joining it, I couldn't get anything to load. <laughs> it was just the worldwide wait. I felt like, you know, it was 1997 again or something. And I was on dial-up. Yeah, and, and, and not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. And so I, uh, I, I, I was praying, uh, piously hoping that it would cease to be a dumpster fire after a couple of weeks. And sure enough, uh, it seems to be working fairly snappily now. Gadius has been calling out people and getting them to try and open up Gab accounts, and I think that's a good thing to do. I would like to see everybody on Gab and to make a point of cross-posting, and it would be great if there was some kind of app that would automatically cross-post Gab and Twitter. Boom. That would, be, that would make everything so simple. Absolutely. And then eventually, eventually we'll just pull the plug on Twitter, or Twitter will pull the plug on us. Uh, eventually, it's going to happen. Your days there are numbered. And it would be nice to have uh, everybody basically on the arc at that point over at Gab so we can continue our conversation. I use Twitter mostly as a news feed and an opportunity to promote things to my followers. My followers don't see it, though. I've been shadow banned for all eternity on Twitter, probably. This, this is what's so ridiculous. I mean, even if you're on there, it's a sort of illusion. You're on yeah. there, but no one's listening because your voice is secretly muted. Yeah. I mean, it's so just, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I have a little more than a thousand people in my Telegram channel. If you haven't followed my Telegram channel, please follow it. I've got a little more than a thousand people in the Telegram channel. I know they're seeing it all. Uh, I've got nearly 20,000 people on Twitter and probably fewer than a thousand see my stuff anyway. So what's the point? It's a farce at that, in that point. Case, yeah. Exactly. In that case, you might as well be on Telegram. I mean, let me see how many you've got on Telegram now. You've got over a thousand. Um, that's, you're probably getting an equivalent uh, exposure on Telegram that you were getting on Twitter. Yeah. And I have more than 3,000 followers on Gab, and I think I'm getting you know more bang for the buck than I am with nearly 20,000 people on Twitter. So yeah, uh, Twitter is a farce. It's a game. It's a psyop. And we just need to break the addiction. And uh, 
And one of the things that keeps me go going back there, though, is that I have friends there and I want to see their stuff or they send me messages there. And so I keep going back. I actually removed it from my toolbar, though. So it's, I just don't have a Twitter icon up there anymore that I can click. It's, it's funny. I don't miss it at all. I mean, when I first got banned, it was a huge traumatic loss, uh, as some people will remember. That was at the end of September 2018. Um, so then I created my sock account and then that got banned after 3,000, 3,500 followers. And then that happened again and again and then again. I think I had five or I think I had four sock accounts, something like that. And then finally it got banned about in the middle of last year. And and I just realized I, I'm not, I can't be bothered creating another one. I just don't care anymore. I'm just sick of this fucking platform. And, uh, and I've never looked back. Um, you know, I follow the people that I want to follow on Telegram. I'm in touch with everyone on Telegram, barring a few who are yet to go over there. Um, but everyone that I want to be in touch with, it, I mean, I've still got a few on Skype from the old days. But other than that, everyone I, I speak to on, on, on Telegram. So I don't need Twitter for that anymore. Um, I think it's a bad idea to rely on Twitter to be in contact with people because, you know, for, well, for obvious reasons, you, know, you can lose that at any moment. Yeah, and, and let's be honest. Uh, do you want the people who are monitoring your tweets to be monitoring your private chats? Exactly. Because you know what's happening. You know that's happening. There are no secrets on there. There's no privacy on there. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm not saying anything on Twitter in these private messages that I wouldn't have read out before a grand jury anyway, <laughs> or that I don't say on my own platform anyway. Um, most of the only thing that I, I do say there that I don't say publicly is just making little plans with people like, oh, can you send this tomorrow? Yeah, that kind of stuff. But all of that, uh, frankly, can be, um, you know, read to a grand jury if necessary. So I kind of don't care that I'm living in a fishbowl over there, but uh, eventually it'll go away and I want to have all my friends available elsewhere. So let's look and see if there are more questions. Okay. Okay, so it's interesting how how nice how nice the dissident right the old right has become primarily because of social media censorship and i assume opprobrium so until hailgate in november of 2016 the alt right was regarded as a bunch of you know pranksters and then after hailgate the alt right became thought of in, in the wider community as neo-Nazis and there's been tremendous blowback against the alt-right and wow the the alt-right the distant right they have completely transformed the way they speak I mean they now speak with an idea of how normies will respond to them so I think Europeans learn to adjust their, their speech to fit within what was legally acceptable because Europe has far more draconian speech laws than the United States. So European right-wing dissidents, they always frame their arguments in much more polite and normie friendly and acceptable ways than uh, American, many American right-wing dissidents. So you couldn't just uh, you know, put the Jews on blast in Europe because that wasn't just against social media policies, that was against the law of uh, Germany and France and England I assume Spain and the Scandinavian countries as well. So European distant right members had to learn to make their points in, in a more acceptable fashion. So they had to put more effort into it. I, I found you can pretty much always make your point. It's just that uh, you have to take other people more into consideration if you want to make your point and then live to <laughs> live for another day. Right? If you don't take other people into consideration, and you just say what you want to say, then the blowback can be incredibly intense and uh, people get sick of it, just like blokes. Now, most blokes have had the experience of being punched in the face, right? Sheila's, like, Sheila's get, get away with saying things that blokes would never get away with because most Sheila's have not had the experience of getting punched in the face. But most blokes have had the experience of getting punched in the face. So they don't say generally speaking, the kind of outrageous, cruel, insulting things that Sheila's get away with. Now, in real life, you learn fairly quickly when you're a normal bloke that, okay, there are certain things you can't say to someone without getting punched in the face. I remember sometimes uh, friends of mine will come into the chat and they'll go, oh, look, you're lying. So it's not that I'm just wrong, that I don't understand something, but they're saying I'm lying. Well, that you know, people who speak that way who are friends and they just come into the chat and they just start accusing me of lying. I just assume they've never been punched in the face. Because if I invite you to my dinner party and you come in and I'm holding forth to my guests at my dinner party and you just start saying, oh, 40, you're lying. You're just totally full of it. That's that's just a big lie where you stop gaslighting. You, you wouldn't get invited back to, to my dinner party. 
But uh, some guys have not gotten punched in the face, so they get used to a careless and cruel type of rhetoric that uh, most blokes who have been punched in the face know better than to engage in. Somebody who goes by the name Mobility Scooter uh, has written in with the question, what's wrong with narcissism? Well, <laughs> do you want to uh, start on that question? <laughs> oh, God. I mean, I don't like the word narcissist or narcissism because it gets thrown around so freely nowadays. People use it to mean a very broad spectrum of behaviors, which isn't good because when someone uses it, you don't really know what they're referring to. But it, but broadly speaking, um, it means someone who doesn't take doesn't have an interest in other people's feelings, doesn't take an interest in them, and basically just uses other people. But that's not really precise enough because that would also apply to borderline personality disorder, for example, psychopathy, sociopathy. So I don't know. I mean, there's an element of self-aggrandizement which I think is un fairly unique to narcissism. But basically, I'm. I, because of the, all this ambiguity, I don't really want to answer this question, so I, I think I should just turn it over to you. But what I would say is, um, what's wrong with it is that it's, uh, you don't want to deal with someone who doesn't give a shit about other people, because that person is inevitably going to be... Okay, so narcissism for most people is a state rather than a condition. So, for example, right now I am in a more narcissistic state than if I were just normally engaging with people in shore. So without narcissism is the desire for recognition. And at, at, if your intensity of your desire for recognition is a nine or a 10 out of 10, then you're probably in prison. Okay, so I think that my narcissism is topped out at like eight at times in my life. On the other hand, you don't want to be at a two. If my narcissism was at a two, I wouldn't do this show. I wouldn't do this show with a three. I probably wouldn't do it with a four. So my perception of course i could be completely wrong is that when i'm doing this show my my narcissism you know, ranges from five to six so without some desire for attention without some desire for recognition you're not going to perform you're not going to write music you're not going to write books you're not going to perform you're not going to do live streams you're not going to do podcasts you're not going to become a prayer leader, a faith leader, run for political office without some desire for recognition. So healthy five or a six is uh, the sweet spot. If your narcissism is down at a three, you're not going to put yourself forward and you're probably going to hold back from sharing your gifts with the world. On the other hand, if I start getting to a seven, then I stop caring about what the effect of my words and behavior is on other people. And I start if I'm at a seven, that means I'm needy. And so I'll come across as needy for attention. I will be less likely to have the inner fortitude to buck my audience's opinions. I will be chasing applause from my audience. I'll be chasing likes. Uh, I'll be chasing strokes. I won't have the, the fortitude to simply stand on my own two feet and honestly tell you what I think. Because when I'm when my narcissism starts ticking up to a seven or an eight, I feel myself just adapting to every situation with the idea of trying to manipulate things for the absolute maximum of attention. And so I'm so changeable in different circumstances that uh, I feel like I have no inner core and uh, people can, can spot how I'm trying to manipulate or they, they just feel uncomfortable. So narcissism, useful in, insight that, that I learned. It's for most people, it's more of a state than, than a permanent condition. So in certain circumstances, you can become quite attention-seeking. And to a certain level, that's healthy, but if it gets too high, then it becomes unhealthy and destructive. Very destructive. Yeah, I, so you have two answers to that. One, you, you what's wrong with the concept is that it's vague, but there are certain types of people who are said to be narcissists who are, who are pretty toxic and bad. Uh, most people recognize that it's, it's a negative term. Yeah, I, the first question should be, what is narcissism? The, the myth of Narcissus is that Narcissus is this beautiful youth who looks at his reflection in water and becomes transfixed, becomes absorbed, uh, becomes imprisoned by his own reflection. And so it's a, it's a form of bondage to your own self-image as it's uh, manifested externally to yourself. And that obviously isn't a good thing. Narcissus wastes away, right? Uh, it's not healthy to be in bondage to your image as it's reflected in other people. Uh, or other things like a mirror, but the, the social sense of narcissism is that you are a prison to your self-image reflected back to you from other people. And so it's a form of dependency, psychological dependency on other people for validation, right? Well, I do think though that, that there's also a sense of narcissism that just means self-love. 
oftentimes, or having a sense of pride. One of the things that's so destructive about modernity and modern psychology is that it doesn't have any kind of vocabulary for dealing with honor and legitimate self-love, legitimate pride, legitimate self-esteem, really. Well, I guess there's that word self-esteem. Uh, but the Greeks, uh, you know, with Plato, uh, Plato has a three-part psychology. He talks about reason, spirit, and desire. And the middle part of the soul, spiritedness, has everything to do with your sense of honor. And that's validated very much by the Greeks. And in modern society, we don't have a positive notion of honor anymore. We have this notion of narcissism. Uh, it's sort of chicks uh, complaining about their boyfriends. Oh, you, your ego, your ego, uh, you're so narcissistic. And there's a legitimate dimension, though, to being concerned about your self-image or being angry when people dishonor you or mistreat yes. you. And, yes. and that has dropped out of the picture with modern psychology uh, and, and the modern charge of narcissism. So a, a lot of what you call masculine honor is just pathologized in modern society. We have this notion of toxic masculinity now. I, I remember seeing, I did a video in, must have been late 2015, about this fucking comedian I saw. Um, and it was this clip where she was basically making fun of the fact that men want respect. Men seek to be respected by other men and by women. And this comedian was mocking that as if it was just some sort of pointless vanity some and, and something unhealthy. She was pathologizing it. Of course, no one will be surprised to, to know that I later learned a certain thing about that comedian's early life. Uh, she well, was an it, early it was, life person. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was just so, again, it's like every single, you know, it, it, it's, so, time, yeah. it, it's so stereotypical because she was attacking something that was key. And as I said in the video at the time about this, if you attack, if you, if you tell men that they shouldn't seek respect, you will not like the results. You will absolutely not like the society that that leads to because men will just, well, they'll just go away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so th that, that I think is important. Uh, um, so what's pathological about narcissism? Because there is something pathological about it. There's a bad sense of narcissism. The good sense of narcissism, I think, is legitimate pride in your achievements, uh, accurate self-estimation, accurate self-worth, self-worth based on, on real facts. Uh, that's that's a legitimate thing, and a lot of times that is poo-pooed and pathologized in modern culture, and that's a bad thing to do. However, I, I think that there is a bad sense of narcissism, and really for me, the key to it, what makes it bad, is whether or not it involves lying, right? If you are an accomplished person, okay, I, I, know, I know beautiful people. I, I know some people who are just ridiculously good looking, right? They're just beautiful people. And, you know, they, they spend time primping and making themselves look good, and they're, they're constantly checking themselves out in the mirror and stuff like that. And it's easy to mock that, right? It, it's, it's really easy to mock that. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you're beautiful, uh, nothing feels better than being, you know, evaluated correctly for your traits. And, of course, the most superficial traits that you can see across the room is beauty, right? And there are other traits that are less apparent, but if you're talented or something like that. If you're beautiful, if you're talented, if you're accomplished, and people recognize that, that feels really good, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting that. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with sharing your talents and your gifts with the, the world, or just sharing your beauty with the world, if you got it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to give any oxygen to the resentful mentalities that want to snipe at people like that from their inferiority, right? Because that's a, a lot of what's going on here is that the inferior people are trying to tear down beautiful people by trying to make them seem ugly or empty in a certain way. But there's a beautiful little book by Mishima called Star or Beautiful Star. It's a little novella. It was just recently published in English translation like a couple years ago. And it's a, an exquisite little book about an actor and his friend. Uh, and it's just a portrayal of narcissism. But it's a portrayal of narcissism at its least pathological. Right. It's just why, why wouldn't you want to show it off and frolic if you're a beautiful beast? You know, that's the kind of thing that's being said here. So I, I think there's something to be validated about that. The only thing that makes narcissism, the, the desire for recognition, pathological is when you fake it. When you try and get that recognition, not based on your real achievements, your real traits, but by tricking people. Because what that does is that means that your validation uh, really depends on faking it, being fake and manipulating other people. And that is a profound form of psychological dependency. And it also makes you ridiculous because, you know, you're never going to succeed uh, in the long run. And so what happens is you uh, you tend to have narcissists. Narcissists will come on strong at the beginning. They will get their mitts on you. They will bamboozle you. They will pretend that there's something that they're not. They harvest a lot of satisfaction from that, from your... Okay, so good people make you feel good and uh, bad people make you feel bad. So... If you got someone in your life who's consistently making you feel bad, then if you can, start distancing yourself. So psychopaths, they drain you. They make you feel bad. So the truth for live streamers and podcasts, you watch a live stream and it makes you feel good, then the person's probably healthy and good for you. And uh, if you usually leave a radio show or a live stream or a podcast, usually feeling more angry, then uh, 
that person's probably bad for you. Delus your delusional uh, praise and love of them, whatever. And then because you can't keep up the lie forever, it all collapses and you have to start over from, with some other sucker. That's a very, very empty life. And it's a life that's inconsistent with free relationships with others, where you're not just trying to dominate other people and manipulate other people. You can never be equals with a narcissist. They're always, they're always trying to pick your pocket. They're always trying to manipulate you and fool you. And uh, ultimately, their lives are very empty. And they create havoc in the lives of other people because, well, when, you know, when sometimes when the manipulation breaks down and sometimes when you see through them, uh, they go into rages, right? Nobody walks out on me, that kind of shit. Uh, that can often lead to violence and, and worse. So uh, they're just dangerous to know. But what's wrong about these people is not that they're looking for validation for their traits, but, the, but what's wrong is that their excellences aren't real. Uh, and they are basically manipulating and fooling other people in order to gain some kind of satisfaction. That's pathological. That's wrong. And people like that need to be avoided. But if, if, if you are a truly excellent person and you enjoy being uh, recognized for your excellences, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, that, that, uh, that I think should be validated. Yeah, of course it absolutely should. And, and it's, it's disgusting if someone attacks that need in a person, because otherwise, you know, if life isn't about doing well and being recognized for doing well, then, well, you're going to get a lot of people who have no reason to, to do well anymore. You're going to get a lot of people who just start thinking, well, what, the, what the hell, I'll just suit myself. Yeah, yeah. Again, the, the only people who want to tear down that are losers, uh, resentful losers, basically. Uh, they, they, want to, they want to unstring the, the bow or the lyre, the, the tension that creates uh, excellence, that causes people to strive to be excellent. People who are always poo-pooing competition. These are bad people, generally. Uh, why? Uh, well, because they're losers in the competitions of life, and they would rather tear down excellence and tear down the conditions for excellence than feel bad about themselves. Unknown Californian uh, writes in uh, with five US dollars. Thank you for that. If you could make one state the ethnostate, which would you choose? If you had to give up a state for, say, a black ethnostate, which one would you choose? <laughs> well, I will answer this one. Uh, I would choose California for the ethnostate. I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done with California to make it into the ethnostate, but I would definitely choose California because... It's the most beautiful state in America, as far as I'm concerned. I love living there. If you could uh, give up a state for a black ethno state, which would you choose? Honestly, you know, I would choose Alaska. <laughs> I'm sort of half joking. Uh, uh, I've, I've never actually been to Alaska. Um, but I, I like the South so much. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to give any of the, the southern states up for the black ethno state. So I would pick somebody co someplace cold and remote <laughs> rather, than, uh, rather than the South. But realistically, uh, it would be somewhere in the South. And I would think maybe... Maybe like uh, you could put together something that would take certain chunks out of like Alabama, Mississippi, and so forth, and uh, make that the black ethno state somewhere in the deep south. Uh, that that would make sense to me. Uh, Woes, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, only that I think California would be a, a very difficult choice to make it as a white ethno state because you'd have to basically displace. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think it would be better to give that to the minorities, you know, just give it to the Hispanics and the Jews and so on. And... Whoa, 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 whoa! Let's let's disavow that that kind of talk. We. You don't need any of that kind of talk. This is a show of, of love and inclusion. Let's, uh, let's end things. St. Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney.
Oh man, is that it? I, I was just I was just getting into it. Sydneycathedral.com. Damn, that, that went so fast. I, I was just I was just enjoying it. And now now we 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 really we we have to say goodbye. I don't want to leave. Uh, how can I how can I leave now? I was having such a good time. Okay, where's that bridge over troubled water? The oh, just let me just play this. Uh, I I'll swear I'll leave. Uh, hang on just a sec. Come on. Just let me just please just let me play this. Feel 